just for for the record um i will be excusing myself at 9 45 to do the groundbreaking for the safari expansion at the fresno chaffee zoo our crown jewel um as mr council vice president would say uh, so our council vice president will take over um, during my departure. Um, so this is my warning, Mike, Luis, Nelson, Gary, mm -hmm. be nice to him and treat him well. Um, <laughs> if not, we're gonna have to I will. Him when I return. Yeah, so we I actually like him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I love you guys. All right, with that, um, let's go ahead and do roll call city clerk. Councilmember Bredefeld. Here. Councilmember Chavez. Here. Councilmember Esparza. Present. Councilmember Cravasi. Present. Councilmember Soria. Council Vice President Capriolio. Here. And President Arias. Present. Next will be the Pledge of, Alle of Allegiance. Uh, Gavin, do you have the video? Yeah, give me one second. Any of the other council members, do the images uh, freeze on Zoom for you guys? A little bit. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Thank you. City Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, yes, there are. Let's see. Uh, two of the proclamations that's on today's agenda are being removed. In the minutes, we have some changes from Councilmember Carbasi, and uh, we will make those corrections. It has to do with the um, uh, honoring Bob Caldwell, former mayor, and he wants the word former removed. We'll get that done. So you'll be approving those as amended. Um, the uh, file ID 20-00-1267, one o'clock, timed item, is being moved to 10, 10 a.m. And there's a, a correction in section number six on the top of page six due to a formatting error. Mm -hmm. Item 4A will be heard at 10.30 a.m. Item 4C, we're adding Council Member Chavez as a sponsor. And item table to 10.15 is item 1B and 1S as in Sam. City Clerk? Yes. Uh, the 10.10 was moved to 1 p.m. Are you saying they're trying to move it back? It, it does say that. It says it has been moved. Oh, I'm sorry. It has been moved from 10.10 a.m. to the 1 o'clock. Okay. Guys, thank you. All right. Any other changes to the agenda? Any clerk? No one, no other changes. Okay. Council members, do you have changes to the agenda? Motion to approve. Um, okay. give me one second. Um, I want to table item one B as in boy for the October 15th meeting. Um, I want to give um our frequent users, the media and the press, some time to play with the new software um, before we formally approve. So we'll move that to 1015. Also item one, S is in Sam. You had yes. that one table as well? Yes, 1015. Okay. Mm -hmm. That one, that's gonna go to the COVID committee for review, and then we'll bring it back on 1015 for approval. Mr. President? Yes. I'm confused. Which one's going to the COVID committee? A 1S, it's a CARES Act item. Why can't it be discussed by the council today? We're all here. It I'm can just curious. Be. It can be. I mean, how do the other committee members feel? I'm okay either way. If you guys want to hear it, that's fine. Okay. So would you like to hear it today? Let's hear it today. And then if in discussion we decide we want to send it to the COVID committee, we can do it then, please. All right, that's fine. We'll keep it Thank on you. the agenda. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, there's a motion by Council Vice President to approve the agenda as amended. I'll second it. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbassi? Aye. Council Member Soria? Absent. Council Vice President Capriolio? 
Yes. And President Arias. Yes. All right, Council, we don't have any ceremonial presentations. Before we go into um, closed session, I do want to give the opportunity for Council Member Chavez to say a few words on who we're going to adjourn the meeting on whose behalf. Yeah, thank you, President. I just wanted to, you know, give an extra special thanks to uh, United Health Centers. As many of us know, um, Dr. Shankerman um, lost his battle with COVID uh, recently, and uh, he was very instrumental in helping set up all the protocols for uh, the health clinics that UHC operates. Um, and I understand that that was the model used for other um, FQHC. So I wanted to uh, adjourn the meeting in his name. And then also, um, as if, you know, that wasn't bad enough. We lost a great uh, educator uh, principal uh, in Southeast Fresno um, and my former teacher at Roosevelt, uh, Mr. Tim Lyles, um, uh, lost his battle with uh, cancer. And, you know, I just want to express my condolences to the family. Um, there was a vigil uh, held um, last night outside of Sunnyside High. Um, and I think that just tells you the, the impact that he had in the in the area, and and you know I wanted to adjourn uh, today's meeting uh, in both of their uh, names, um, so I'd appreciate that. Council President, yes, Council Vice President, you have the floor. If uh, I I too would like to adjourn today's meeting in memory of Bob Spencer, he was a former Fresno State women's basketball coach. He was a legend for a number of reasons. He became the first NC two A women's basketball coach to earn 500 career wins. Uh, Coach Spencer led the Bulldogs twice to appear in the women's NIT tournament, 1986 and 1990. So our prayers and our thoughts are with his friends and his family. So if he can do a journey in his loving memory today, I'd appreciate that as well. Thank you. So move. Um, thank you, council members. It's been a tough uh, 2020 for a lot of us and we've had a lot more losses and wins, but we'll keep mm -hmm. on working through the year and and hope for brighter days. Um, with that, for the general public, we will go into closed session now, after which we will return with the consent calendar. At that time, we will also take public comment on the consent calendar and unscheduled oral communications um, at that time when we return from closed session. So council, you should have a closed session link on your calendars um, under closed session. We will see you there in a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, um, legal counsel, um, what's in closed session, please, for the record? Right. We have only conference with legal counsel concerning public security. Thank you. Thank you, city attorney. Okay, folks, let's go to our agenda. We're going to do something very unusual. We're going to try to be timely. So we're going to go to the 10 a.m. item first. The hearing to adopt resolutions and ordinance annexing property in a special levy in District 2. This is a, a, a staff presentation by Public Works. This is in two. Does anyone have a motion? Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second it. Wait, uh, which, which item are, is this? I'm sorry, Mr. This is, we're going to do a 10. We're going to be on time. We're going to do a 10 a.m. item at 10 a.m. Okay, got it. Got it. Uh, Thank you. Is there anyone in the public, uh, the community wishes to make some constructive comments on this item that is a 10 a.m. item? Seeing none, uh, any council comments? Excuse me, Paul, there are members of the public that wish to make comments. On the 10 a.m. item. They have yeah. their hands up. Okay. Yes, sir. First. So there is going to be Lisa Flores first, Tyler Mackey second, Gloria Hernandez third. Thank Tyler, you. or Lisa, go ahead. A uh, real quick question, Paul. Um, I thought you have to take uh, public comments and concerns first before you move to the agenda items even if they're timely because you know that's what I was led to believe and I've been hanging out waiting for you guys to come back into session so I can make my public comments regarding your agenda. Yeah, we'll take that at a later uh, later time. We're gonna try to stay on schedule here with the 10 a.m. item. It, is and that like in violation of Robert's rules? No, it's not. That is not required. Thank you. Did you wish to comment on the 10 a.m. item? If not, we'll move to the- No, actually I have three comments on your agenda actually. Okay, well, when we have open uh, session, then we'll take those comments or on item by item, but thank you for phoning in. Appreciate you. Uh, next would be Tyler Mackey. 
Tyler, do you have comments, brief comments on the 10 a.m. item? I just jumped back on because um, you guys were in closed session and I was just kind of standing by. So are we discussing, are we up for 4A at this point where we can discuss that? No, we're at the 10 a.m. item at page six of our agenda. So we're gonna try to do the timed items out of respect for those that have set timed items. And then we'll go back to the regular agenda. Uh, Gloria? Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing because I was led to believe that public comment was the first item. Sure. No, it's not. Uh, we're going to do the timed items first and then we'll go back to that as soon as we can get through these uh, two or three items that we set on the agenda. So thank you. Uh, any other uh, comments from my colleagues or are we ready to vote? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Council Member Bredito. Yes. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Councilmember Esparza? Aye. Councilmember Carbasi? Aye. Councilmember Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. And President Arias is absent. Okay, the uh, 10, 10 05 and 10 10 items have been continued. That puts us at the 10 15 item. It's now 10 17. This is a consideration of a text amendment application. Uh, from Planning and Development Department. Are we ready to proceed? Or is there a motion? Motion to approve. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Thank you much. Um, we'll go to the public. Does the public uh, wish to comment on the 1015 item? No, mm -hmm. sir. No, okay. sir. Okay. Screen is clear. Uh, council members, anyone wish to address the 1015 item? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Council Member Bredefield? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Aye. Council Member Soria? Yes. Vice President Capriolio? Yes. President Arias is absent. Okay. Uh, City Attorney, can I go 1020 now? It's a joint meeting with Fresno Joint Powers Financing Authority, which is the last timed item. You're muted, City Attorney. City Attorney, you're muted. Yeah, Council Vice President. My sorry. Oh, sorry. For the 1020, it includes the Fresno Joint Powers Financing Authority. We need at least two of the Mayor, Council President, and Council Member Soria. So you might want to circle back to that one. Would the mayor and uh, council member Sawyer be adequate? We yes. are attempting to get the mayor on right now. Okay. Uh, take a it may take a few minutes. I can't count that. Might we go past the consent agenda? We've got to do the comments on the, uh, the, comments on the open uh, schedule before we get to the consent agenda. Um, I, I, I've got it. Well, if you'll round up the mayor, let me know. We'll jump to that as soon as he's available. That puts us back on uh, council member uh, reports and comments. I'll start off uh, that segment. Uh, this, uh, this morning, we did our second uh, distribution of Safer Food Meal, a program for our seniors. That was initiated by member Carbasi, member Chavez, and myself. I drove over there today, and we had a long line of cars of seniors who are interested in that fantastic well-balanced meal. And we're doing that distribution next Thursday as well. So I wanna thank all those that were involved. That's Pardini's Catering, the volunteers, Parks, Aaron Aguirre, Northeast Fresno Police Officers, and Fresno State Police Department for helping us get the boxes loaded safely in the cars. My next and uh, final comment is that it's a sad day, but a happy day for the university. And what that means is the good news is for Dr. Castro, he is now a new appointment as chancellor elect of the entire California State University system. Uh, the bad news is I'll miss him and uh, our community will miss him because he's been a great president and a great leader. But his record of accomplishments underscores his commitment to higher education and under his bold leadership that will re be reflected in my view on all the campuses who will all strive to attain even greater success. And as you all know, uh, President Castro and his team put Fresno State on the map. We are in so many uh, areas of accomplishment. We're in the league with uh, Stanford, MIT, 
uh, various major universities. Well, guess what? Fresno State, thanks to Dr. Castro and his boldness, is in that league. So we thank you, Dr. Castro. And, and personally, I'm going to miss you. Uh, I don't think the new president's going to call me Pablo, and I can't call him Bold Joe because you are bold. And I, uh, I, I love our relationship. We both started in 2013, uh, except you've accelerated past me, which is not unusual. But uh, congratulations, sir. I'm wearing my bulldog tie. Uh, in commemoration of this great event for you and your family and the great staff at Fresno State. Thank you very much. Who'd like to speak next? Uh, Member Soria. Thank you, um, Council Vice President. I have a few comments and a request. I, I would like to request this meeting in, um, in adjournment in memory of our um, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, as we all just heard a few days ago, we lost what I believe is an iconic figure um, in our country, um, someone that was a trailblazer for women, um, for gender equality. Um, I want to just, you know, express my gratitude and honor the legacy that she has left. Um, because of her, um, I and women across this country have benefited from her work, we can actually open a bank account and buy a home without having to get a man to co-sign for us. And so she was someone that represents what is equity and justice in our, in our country. And so I do want to adjourn in her memory. We will definitely do that. Thank you for those, uh, that request. And then um, just a couple other comments that I wanted to make. So every year, um, the city of Fresno, and in particular, the Tower District, hosts the Fresno Real um, Pride um, event. It's a film festival that has been going on um, for, I think, three decades or, or, or so. And I just want to remind folks that while we are in COVID, um, they are um, going to be still hosting it, and it's going to be from home. And so this this event is gonna be taking place virtually on Saturday, October 10th, um, starting at 11 a.m. Um, tickets are still available, so um, make sure that you guys you know, go online and find out um, the different featured films that they will be hosting at realpride.com. Um, also wanna remind folks that um, this council approved the Fresno Cares Program. It's also a food distribution. Um, program. This is, we are looking for other community partners. Um, so those that want to um, do additional food distribution in the neighborhoods, um, if you are interested, uh, please call us at 559-234-0707. Um, and that's um, citywide. So for those nonprofits that want to, that need the resources um, or um, want to start a a food distribution distribution site mm -hmm. to please call that number. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Uh, Member Carbasi. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, I wanted to congratulate Bob Myers, who's a District 2 resident. He actually did come to the council meeting last year. He is the winner, again, of the World's Fastest Professional Gunfighters National Championship. It's Fast Draw. And, um, you know, that, that, that's another world championship for him. And that person lives in Fresno. Of course, you know, we can't forget the U.S. Open and Bryson DeChambeau and what he was able to accomplish. It's another champion who has roots in Fresno, having attended Clovis East. Um, we also have a um, comment about Council, Member, Council Vice President made comments about President Castro. I want to thank the Castro family. Um, I like we talked last night. We both agreed to wear our ties today. And um, we really appreciate everything you've done for Fresno State. It's with a lot of pride that we were educated at that fine institution. And, you know, you've been a treasure, a crown jewel of District 4. Now you can be a crown jewel of the state of California. <laughs> Thank you for your service. The last thing I want to say for a program, the Senior Aid for Food and Resources. Um, we're just about to finish week two. I want seniors to know that if you're a city of Fresno resident and you want a week's supply of groceries from the five food groups, uh, we've partnered uh, with Pardini's to do that, and using your CARES dollars, you can call 
or you can go online, which is faster, or if you have a family member that can help you with that, you can go to fresnocovidhelp.com forward slash S-A-F-R, fresnocovidhelp.com, and we will um, be sure to get you signed up. And signups for next week begin Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, I'm going to share a letter, just I'll read part of it, that was left by a resident uh, at the distribution center, one of his sites. Her name is Dolores Davidian, and I'm going to give this to the clerk so it could be on the record. Um, but I'm just going to say, uh, read the first part, expressing my heartfelt gratitude to Fresno's leaders, Fresno City Council, Pardini's, and all others who are sponsoring the Senior Aid for Food and Resources program. Because of COVID-19, many seniors are fearful of shopping. Depending on others to supply our basic needs, we feel is a super great imposition. Mm -hmm. Some seniors have transportation issues. Okay. The Senior Aid for Food and Resources program is such a marvelous redeeming way of keeping us safe from the many germs that easily could attack our vulnerable immune system. And a bushel of thank you for all those who sacrifice time, money, talents, and love to give Fresno seniors a gift of nourishing, delicious food. Thank you so much, Dolores. You are the reason why we do these things. It does take work, but uh, we're here to serve. And I want to thank my colleagues for supporting the program. And hopefully, when the pilot is over, we can extend the program for a full citywide. It's open to all city residents, but we can have distribution centers citywide. That's the hope. Thank you so much, Dolores. That, those are my comments. Thank you, Member Carbasi. Next. I think the screen is clear. Uh, I understand. Uh, oh, uh, 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 I, uh, uh, Member Sparza. Oh, no, 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 Nelson, you go ahead. Uh, I'll be I'll be quick. I just uh, wanted to uh, reiterate that we'll be having a mobile testing clinic for COVID-19 uh, tomorrow morning at McLean High School between 8 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m. Uh, and also be giving away uh, masks uh, there as well. So I think I announced that last week. We're just reinforcing that now that we're a lot closer. And then uh, just as my colleagues have done, I want to extend you know publicly my sincere congratulations to uh, President Castro. Uh, fun fact, when I, uh, when I was at uh, an undergraduate at UC Riverside, I did not have the privilege of attending Fresno State, uh, but Timothy White was my, uh, my uh, campus uh, chancellor over at uh, UC Riverside, and uh, he moved on to become the, the CSU uh, chancellor, and, and I'm really glad to see uh, President Castro now moving into that position as Chancellor White uh, transitions out. Uh, so again, my sincere congratulations, and that'll be it. Thank you, sir. Uh, we go to uh, member Brennerfield. There you are. Yes, th thank you very much. And I want to echo also what uh, council member Soria said about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, whether you agree with her positions or not. I mean, she was a trailblazer and uh, somebody who led the way for many people and a, an incredible role model. And so uh, want to acknowledge that, that fact for her and uh, we mourn her passing and uh, uh, just a grateful for her service. Uh, having said that, I want to uh, also recognize the uh, uh, the rally that took place uh, uh, the last several days ago about open businesses. Uh, again, businesses that continue to uh, be hurt terribly uh, by the policies of the uh, governor uh, and the policies of uh, the city of Fresno. And so um, they're planning on apparently opening October 1st. It's been six months. Uh, the 14 day uh, uh, flatten the curve in April has turned into the six month nightmare and counting. Uh, additionally, uh, our schools continue to be closed. Uh, the transmission rates for kids just recently passed, uh, uh, unveiled by the CDC is extremely low, remotely low. And yet we know that the kids are being hurt by not being in school uh, in terms of depression, social isolation, anxiety. Uh, we saw recently that uh, suicide uh, rates have spiked. Uh, kids are not uh, who are being abused are not being detected, uh, protected because they're not in school. And so the destruction from these uh, foolish uh, policies uh, continue. Uh, I would encourage this council uh, to uh, uh, stop uh, pressing on businesses and allow them uh, to open up and they will do so safely following the CDC guidelines as they did months ago before they were shut down again. Uh, by the governor, who initially declared that uh, uh, some uh, 26 million Californians would be infected by May. Uh, he's fallen short by 25 million people. Um, this is a man who we've all uh, sought his uh, leadership on COVID-19 uh, to make us safe. And this is the man who's released 20,000 inmates 
uh, in our community, has homeless all over the highways that we can't remove by his edict. Uh, so he's not making anybody safe. Uh, we have shootings uh, every night and stabbings most days, 80% increase in uh, shootings since April. Uh, and that's because of these releases and no bail uh, policy. Thank so, you, yeah, I'm going to finish. The, that's uh, basically uh, the person that uh, our, our city is looking to for leadership. The county looks to for leadership, and there is no leadership. The goalposts change. So, um, we need to do something to help our businesses. I think we can, and hopefully, we will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, screen is clear. Uh, well, now I see the mayor will jump to the 1020 joint meeting with Fresno Joint Powers Financing Authority. These are actions pertaining to the issuance of uh, Series 2020A bonds. Uh, I don't know, Mayor, would you like to start it or City Manager, who would like to take the item? I, and I have I have Mike Lima here when you're ready. Mayor, do you want do you want to say anything, or can we turn it over to Mike? Sure, Mike. Okay. Okay. This is 1020, right? Good morning, Council members and JPFA board members. Mike Lima, Finance Director, Controller. Before you today is an item that will authorize the sale of no more than $22 million of bonds, the proceeds of which will be used to fund the construction and equipping of a new animal control shelter located at 5277 East Airways Boulevard. Department, that's in District 4. It is in District 4, you are right, yes. Um, the animal shelter will consist of five buildings which will support the shelter's administration, operations, veterinary, animal housing, and customer service functions. The facility is planned to open in late 2021. And to facilitate that opening, council awarded a construction contract to North Star General on May 21st, 2020. The facility will be owned by the Joint Powers Financing Authority and leased back to the city under the 2008 master lease at a rate equal to the annual debt service payment. The payment is expected to be no higher than 1.8 million a year. However, the actual annual debt service won't be known until the bond sale is complete. The lease payment will be a general fund obligation. The bonds will have a maturity of 25 years with final payoff occurring on April 1st, 2046. Staff expects the bond sale to occur in about two weeks with the sales closing occurring by the end of October. Staff recommends that both the council and JPFA board approve the resolutions authorizing the sale of these bonds. Thank you. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, it's in district four. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. So does the GP, the JPA have to first take a vote and then the council? I thought it, that the, the order doesn't matter, but it needs to be both independently. So with the J, uh, JPA, uh, is there a motion or a vote? That well, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Just, it's just me and the mayor. Okay, I'll second it. Uh, can we have a roll call vote on both those items? Which ones do I vote on? The first well, let, me, uh, let, me, let me back up. I got ahead of myself. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment on these two items? Well, there's one item, but two facets to it. I put it that way. Uh, I don't see anyone. There is no public comment. Okay, and now we'll back to the council. Anyone else like to uh, speak on this item? Hey, Paul. Hey. Yes, sir. This is part of the process where the SPCA is now canceling the contract. They've given us extensions. So this is a mandated service. This will give us a state-of-the-art facility that our goal down the road will be a kill-free shelter. So it's a big step in the right direction for the city of Fresno. Unfortunately, we will have to incur you know, some debt service to build it, but I think it's a, a, a strong step in the right direction. It should be done by late next year. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilman Soria, Councilman Betterfield for being on the committee that uh, that saw this through, and we're monitoring their progress closely and uh, looking forward to it being completed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Betterfield. I think we're ready to vote. But go ahead, sir. Yeah, I just want to also uh, I want to thank uh, Sal Gonzalez, uh, Mr. Ed Cashin, and uh, Mike Carbasi, uh, and others who uh, helped uh, in getting that land. Uh, the gap and I frankly want to thank the gap for participating uh, in helping uh, solve a critical need in the city of Fresno, which we obviously had. I mean, many people have expressed concern about things uh, for some time. And I think this in the future uh, is going to be a great thing for the city of Fresno and of course for our animals, which is what this is. This is all about. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Uh, Doug, uh, 
can we take one vote on both these uh, items or do they need to be individually voted? Why don't you have the council vote and then have the authority take their act? Very good. So uh, Madam Clerk, the council's ready to vote. Would you have a roll call please? Council Member Bredefield? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Kabasi? Aye. Council Member Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. Uh, next, we'll have a roll call vote on the Fresno Joint Powers Committee. Is that the proper title? Yes, this, yeah. this is the mayor and council member Soria now. Correct. The roll call, please. Okay. Council member Soria. Actually, they need to make a motion and second. Well, they made the motion. motion. He made the motion and the mayor will need to second. Okay. So, mayor, are you seconding it? It's, it's seconded. Okay. For the time. Uh, Remember those old days? Very good. A roll call, please. Council Member Soria. Yes. And Mayor Brand. No. Congratulations. Uh, job well done to the whole team that's been involved with this. I know a lot well of people have touched this particular item. So, uh, congratulations to all and thanks to everyone who's made this possible for our community. Uh, clarification, Madam Clerk. Item 4A, was that? Time for 1030. Yes. Okay, we'll go to that item now. This is item 4A. Trying to stick with our timeliness. And uh, this is a bill for introduction and adoption uh, relating to outdoor dining. And this is sponsored by Council Member Soria. Uh, uh, do you have a motion, Member? Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion. Second. Second, second by Member Car. So we have a motion by Member Soria. Second. And then, uh, okay. Go ahead, uh, if you have a comment, sir. No, go ahead, Council, Council Vice President. Okay. I think there's some question. Yeah, we have the motion, uh, again, by Member Soria, seconded by Member Carbasi. Uh, we can go to the public. Anyone in the public wish to uh, be heard on this item? I think Tyler Mackey uh, mentioned this, right? Yes, Tyler Mackey has raised his hand. Okay, well, uh, Mr. Mackey, you ha uh, you're... Uh, uh, you're welcome to comment on this item. Thank you, Council and uh, Council Vice President. Uh, my name is Tyler Mackey, and I am the Executive Director of the Tower District Marketing Committee, a 22 year old uh, nonprofit business association that represents the businesses of the Tower District. We are a 20 plus member organization, and we represent the majority of the bars and restaurants. Uh, we uh, appreciate all that the City of Fresno has done for the Tower District, but on this item, it's very important to us that we begin to restore the culture of our community and bring back some of the jobs. We're, we're struggling to fill our patios um, and music is one thing that we believe can bring people back. It's something people come to expect of our community and we'd like to see it back. Um, we believe we can do it very safely. We believe that um, it is happening already all over town. It's just being done um, as businesses decide they want to do it. So it's creating an unfair playing ground for everybody and our district, a lot of our members, um, we haven't been showing up at rallies. We've been silent, you know, quietly talking with council and working on solutions. Um, but this is one that we feel it's time for us to speak up and say, please let us bring music back in a safe way that's regulated um, and that meets some parameters. There are mariachi bands all over town playing. This sets up some reasonable restrictions and allows us to safely bring business back to our, our desperately uh, hurting businesses. And we understand that this is a time where uh, if we move into the, the next level down, um, it becomes safer. Uh, we're not going to be trying to move these things back inside if we're allowed to move them outside. Um, but we recognize this is only going to be a small window before the weather turns against us. So we would love to see this happen quickly, um, recognizing it'll only last for a while. So um, we want to make hay while the sun shines, Thank for you. lack of a better phrase. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Anyone else? Uh, there are no other hands raised. Okay, then we'll go back to council. There's a motion and a second. Now, if there's any council comments, uh, Member Bredefield, you have yeah, your- I, I just was wanting to ask uh, council member Sharia, so is that why you wanted to make these changes uh, from what the gentleman uh, was saying? Yeah, so um, restaurants across the city um, have been asking for some relief when it comes to, in, uh, some entertainment and I think this will allow them. It's a reasonable 
policy that would allow in their, in their extension um, so that they're not in violation of any of their CUPs. So okay, that's why you. we're doing it. Thank you. Any other council member? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Council member Bredefeld? Yes. Council member Chavez? Yes. Council member Esparza? Aye. Council member Corbasi? Aye. Council member Soria? Yes. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. Thank you all very much. Uh, congratulations, member Soria. Okay, uh, now we can go to the uh, consent calendar and unscheduled communication. Um, would any member wish to remove anything from the consent calendar? Oh, uh, member Bredefield. I thought we were going to get away with uh, a vote, but member Bredefield. Yeah, no, I'm not removing anything. I just wanted to register a, a no vote on the consent calendar for Q, as in quiet, nobody in particular, and R as in uh, Robert, Q and R. That is so noted, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Member Carbasi. No votes on Q and R, please. Okay. We, uh, Madam Clerk, you have that. Uh, I do. Okay, very good. Anyone else? So, um, Council Vice President, just a point of clarification. So I missed um, early this morning when you, there were changes to the agenda. Were any items removed or um, I was just, I think since I missed that first portion, I just wanted to make sure. The only item that was pulled from consent was item 1B as in boy. And then 1S is going to be heard at what time, clerk? I the ten, nope. 10, 15, I think. I don't think I, it, I think it, it will just be on a contestant consent, which could go right after consent. Okay. So we're indicating one S is contested consent. So that's the only item that's pulled thus far. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, anyone in the public wish to address the consent calendar before we go into a vote and then unscheduled communication? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have Lisa Flores. Lisa, are you uh, may proceed. Um, I got a question. Um, what are you guys doing with the cannabis stuff on uh, Q&R? Did you take it off the agenda or I, I'm, I need some clarification on that. It's on the agenda as far as I know on the consent calendar. There are two registered no votes from members Carbasi and Redfield. So they're voting no on it. But if you guys vote yes on the agenda, it passes. Correct. Okay, thank you. I just need okay. that clarification. You're, you're welcome. Anyone else? Yes, Randy, you're next. Randy, uh, please proceed with uh, some constructive comments. Uh, is this uh, also for, for unscheduled communication? Uh, I was going to do that next, but if okay. you. Okay, yep. I, I can wait till then. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone yep. else? Cody. Cody? Oh, hey, Cody. You're. Uh, uh, Good to hear from you. Uh, he worked for me uh, at the council here. Uh, so you uh, may proceed with your comments, sir. Cody? Cody, you are on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I was just wondering when council was going to address the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. Yeah. One o'clock, I believe. Yeah, 1 p.m. Scheduled for 1 p.m. Much obliged. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Cody. There are no other comments. Okay, very good. Uh, so we have a motion. Do we have a motion on the consent calendar? No, we don't. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar as modified? Second. Uh, so, Member Chavez, I couldn't hear you, but I think it was you. Uh, Council Member Carbasi. Oh, and Sparsa. I was the second. Sparsa. Hey, was first. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, motion by member uh, Sparsa, second by member Carbasi. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, Council member Bradfield? Yes. Council member Chavez? Yes. Council member Sparsa? Aye. Council member Carbasi? Aye. Council member Soria? Excuse me. Council member Soria? 
But yes. Thank you, uh, Council Vice President Capriolio. Yes, uh, and again, the record will uh, note a no vote on items Q and R by members Carbasi and Bredeker. Correct. Very good. Uh, now we can go to unscheduled communication. Uh, I believe Brandy was patiently waiting. We have Crystal Reed. Okay, uh, Crystal, uh, we, we would love to hear your comments. Thank you for letting me address you today. My name is Crystal Reed. I'm with A Plus Property Management, and I am currently a property manager within your community. Um, and I have represent a lot of different owners in different aspects and different uh, um, price points as far as rental price points. Um, I am urging the council to re look at the non-entry of inspections into the homes. Um, we have a lot of deferred maintenance going on. We have tenants calling into code enforcement um, and which is causing a bigger workload on code enforcement. And we are not able to go in and do inspections. Right now we are able to do a couple of different things to get rid of quote unquote tenants not taking care of properties and doing illegal activities via um, uh, evictions. So I am urging the councils to redo the guidelines based on CDC social distancing and and offering or basically giving a different alternative to so we can go in and the owners can maintain their homes, which is one of their biggest investments, and also um, do it in a safe manner. Thank you. Um, I have lots. Of, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you're finished. Uh, you were... No, I have lots of different ideas. I could work with the council on how we can do this in a safe manner, um, but also allow owners um, to have access to their properties. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, chiming in with us. Uh, Gloria Hernandez, I think you're next. Yes, I'm calling about I'm talk, I'm calling about the issue of what happened with the independent review uh, reviewer yesterday. I want to make the following statement for the record. His trust was hanging by a thread and now the thread has been broken and the independent reviewer must release the audit on Linda Wallace and Gerald Johnson immediately. He should then resign in shame. He violated his job duty to quote, work to strengthen community trust in the Fresno Police Department by providing neutral third party review of police policies, procedures, strategies, and internal investigation, unquote. He made a decision that impacts the lives of many of us in Fresno. As a police commissioner, I've been putting in many hours to reform the police. He has made my duty difficult. I have been fighting for civilian review since the late 90s and I've continued to do so for the well being of our community who has lived in fear and has suffered trauma for too many years. He must resign or be terminated. Thank you. Thank you I am almost done with the calendar. Give me three more minutes. We'll finish. Uh, Gloria, thank you for your service uh, to our community as well as in your comments. We appreciate that. Next is Kyle Schmidt. Kyle, uh, hey. give us some Kyle more. Lopez Schmidt, uh, 3035 North Ferris. Um, I also wanted to speak on the independent police auditor. Um, John Glada has uh, really destroyed the public's trust by um, concealing his report. Um, and we demand that he immediately release the, uh, his report on London Wallace and Gerald Johnson. Um, and then that is a uh, demand of the community to um, to the city of Fresno, and we demand that uh, John resign from his position, that he's violated um, his independent police uh, auditor charge, um, and that the the city begin working with the um, police commission on reworking that job position to um, protect against this type of abuse in the future. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate your comments. Who's uh, next? Uh, Adam next Kurt? is Lisa Flores. Hi, Lisa, you have uh, uh, three minutes. Oh, address. three minutes. Oh, okay. No, um, no well, one, I just no, have- no one, no one watches their clock when they speak, so it always goes over. So oh, no, I'll keep it short, Paul, because I got dishes I got to do. No. Um, 
that's why I like Zoom. I can actually clean my house and listen to you guys. Um, uh, I have three general comments. The first one, um, I'm shocked and appalled by the comments and the press release from Andy Hall. Um, I found it, even though he was trying to uplift the police department and uh, the cops, I found it inappropriate, immoral, and racist, actually. I get generally offended anytime I hear a person in power start to talk about circling the wagons. I'm a federally recognized um, tribal Indian. And when I hear circle the wagons, I automatically think of genocidal practices. And these guys are going around with guns. And, you know, um, my forefathers had to live through, you know, a price on their heads as little as 25 cents. But luckily, they didn't wipe us out. This, you know, so I would ask that the city council, you know, uh, admonish this man for his statement. There's a right way to do it, and then there's a wrong way. There's a right way to invoke hope, promise, and perpetual peace in Fresno, and then there's a way to stir it up. Second, uh, the police transparency, the independent report. Um, I'm a little shocked. How come I can't see it? Where's the transparency? We have a young man, 17 years old, that was accosted by the police. That report should be out. There should be some transparency. When you hide things, it just makes people wonder what sort of uh, malfeasance is going on. What are What is the cover up? And then the third is, hey, Gary, I see that, you know, you're still promoting the pandemic business rally number two. Um, just want to remind you that all our businesses would be open and we would have a freer society if you would have preached more about, you know, face masks and safety versus going against the CDC and just continuing your rhetoric of, hey, Lisa, finally. you really need to direct the comments toward me. Uh, okay, finally. Rather than an individual member. Thank you. Okay. Well, finally, then, could you please tell uh, Mr. Arias that I thank him and his staff, particularly his staff person, Ms. Garcia. I thank her very much for the rapid response and positive um, outcome to um, an issue I had regarding some homeless issues in his district and really respect and appreciate not only the rapid response, but also a positive outcome to it. Thank you, so Lisa. I thank you very much for your time. And thank Gary. You. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes, uh, we have Brandy. Oh, Brandy, correct. Thank you for waiting, Brandy. You, you, you may proceed with your uh, constructive comments. Thank you very much, um, Paul, and thank you so much for being considerate of me. Um, the I have three items. The first two that were stated by P, uh, better than I could have. Uh, by uh, so I I just want to stand in agreement with the statements of Gloria and Kyle regarding the audit and ask the same thing. Um, I agree with Lisa regarding the comment um, that that um, that Chief Hall has made and say that his his statement is unacceptable. Um, I also want to express my support for the efforts by the mayor and those of you on the council who have been following local CDC local and CDC guidelines and the state mandates to keep Fresno safe and open business safely. Thank you for speaking up for the vulnerable populations and for pointing out the demographics graphics that are most affected by illness and death. I know you've received a lot of criticism and online attacks for not defying those guidelines, but I want you to know that there's a lot of us who are very grateful. I know it's not easy for businesses right now and emphasize, but I perceive that some of the criticisms are for weak areas in the system that aren't the fault of the council. I appreciate the efforts of the council to provide assistance to the business owners and take steps like the parklets and the outdoor dining. And I appreciate um, the last week's plan to open safely. I thank you for the um, food distributions and the test, uh, the COVID test testing. This hasn't been easy, but we can't pretend this disease isn't harmful. And I am mourning the death of Dr. Shankerman. I'm a patient at uh, United Health Centers, and I hope that his efforts and others who literally gave their lives won't be lost. I am disappointed with those who aren't respecting this and ask that all of the council um, use safe, to, I mean, promote safety so that we can open safely, but that we, we are not sacrificing anyone. Um, thank you, Brandy. And I also want to thank Soria for and uh, those for recognizing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone Next else? We have Carrie. Carrie, uh, 
you, uh... Hi, folks. Thank you for the recognition. My name is Carrie Lorena Yella. My pronouns are she or they. I live and work in District 1. I grew up in the Tower District and have also lived in District 2 and worked in District 3. I am here because you are failing on the issue of police violence, uh, the domination of political processes by police, and the complete and utter lack of accountability that continues to be one of the most pressing issues keeping Fresno in the dark ages and hurting our people. I am a taxpayer and I vote in every election. I organize daily and I practice my spirituality and connect with the next generation to ensure the growth and sustainability of the future of our community. Yesterday, the murderers of Breonna Taylor, may she rest in peace, were acquitted. The country is on fire with rage against anti-Black policing and criminal justice, and not one of you mentioned a thing about the failure of the justice system, nor the violence against people in your own community as reflected in this national struggle. You have a police chief who is publicly catering to the feeling of police in a statement yesterday, in the midst of a revelation that the sole modicum of accountability, the so-called independent advisor, withheld information information about brutality against a black teenager for fear of public response. You have an incoming mayor who during his time as the chief of police had a documented history of racism in attitude and practice. This is not the wild west. These are people's lives. Mary, I've been attending this. You want to wrap it up, please? Here. Sure. I've been attending the so-called commission on police reform meetings, and it is unreal how much administrative time is spent on catering to the tender little feelings of police officers because their jobs are hard and people don't like them. You know who else is in that position? Literally everyone who works with the public. The scourge of poverty, addiction, and mental illness affect our culture at every level and yet y'all continue to invest in policing at the expense of programs and services that will actually provide our community the support and opportunities they so desperately need you, black Sarah. lives appreciate matter your, thank you uh, appreciate your comments uh anyone else yes lastly we have terry terry uh we welcome uh constructive comments terry terry are you there you are ready to be unmute you have to unmute yourself Almost, Terry, you're almost there. Okay. We Tell can... her how to unmute. Well, uh, we, can, we can come back to Terry then. Matthew. Next, we have Matthew. Matthew, uh, you may proceed. Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Woodward. I'm a resident in District 2, and I am very concerned about the news this week about the police auditor and how he, he withheld that report. Um, while I'm a white citizen, I am concerned that if anyone were to be beaten by the police or anything other misconduct, that the police department is not going to be held accountable. It, it's startling to me that this is the same week that Brianna Taylor got no justice for her death at the hands of Minneapolis, of Louisville, Kentucky Police Department. And I don't know, I just... Is there any way I can know for sure that we, anyone who's going to get beaten by the cops or have a unfairly put in jail for a crime they didn't commit, is, is there any way we can be certain that we can get justice in our city today? And besides that, I will uh, end my comments there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Next. That is all. Thank you very much uh, for those comments. Uh, our illustrious president has returned, although I'd ask him to allow me to do one more item, 4C, a resolution uh, authorizing the application of the safer funding grants. This is member Carbasi, and I'll turn it back to the president. I think he's up to speed. After that, I think we have 4B and 4D, and we're pretty much done. But uh, member Carbasi, uh, you have the floor. Hey, member Sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to ask uh, some questions given some of the comments that were made during unscheduled communication to the city manager. Can, can we do this first and then go back to that? I just want to get this done. I, I promised member Carbasi I would. Okay, I would, that's fine. But I did want to have some questions. Yeah, and follow yeah I, I have a question too. So I want to go back to that too. So Council Member Soria, good point. Um, for, for thank, you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Is there a motion? So, yeah, I'd like to make a motion to approve item 4C. I'll second it. Go ahead, sir. Uh, no, I, we just, this is basically instruction that we will apply for the SAFER grant for our fire department. Um, this is the application process and identify funding for drill schools. Um, you know, now, you know, of course, we're all talking about the fires. We've been breathing the air and we know how our neighbors are facing this crisis, but we still have uh, in, in Fresno, uh, a severe demand. We are the sixth largest city by area 
And, you know, we have, I think, a tremendous fire department, but staffing has always been an issue and moving forward, we're going to have to explore grant opportunities. Now, I do want to thank some people for helping me get to this point. Of course, uh, my co-sponsor, I want to thank the city manager for sitting down with me and hashing this out. I want to thank the fire chief and I want to thank the members of Local 753 as well for coming to the table so we can move forward on this important item. Thank you very much. We'll go to uh, public comment. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment on item 4C? There's no public comment. We'll bring it back to the uh, council. Any council members wish to address this? Let me know. Raise your hand. Our uh, screen is clear. Uh, can we have roll call, please? Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Aye. Council Member Soria? Aye. Council Vice President Capriolio? Yes. President Arias? Yes. Uh, President Thank you, Arias, are, are you uh, up to speed on the agenda or I can? Yeah, item. just um, walk me through what items are we on next? Well, we're going to go to our comment by our colleagues that was just mentioned, and then items 4B and 4D are, as I see it, all that's left on the agenda. I believe we're also and supposed to discuss 1S and Sam. That was 1S was that. pulled from the consent calendar. Thank you. Okay. I can continue. Uh, I'll, I'll take over, Council Vice President. Thank you for filling in. You're welcome. It was, uh, it was, uh, I brought back good memories. We moved it along. We're going to be done before 12. They, like Zoom is not difficult. It's not the enemy. You just got to embrace it. All right, council. With that, let's go to um, um, comments from the council. I know there's some outstanding comments that wanted to be made. So we'll turn it over to Councilwoman Soria. After that, we'll go to item 1S under consent. Uh, council Member Carbasi wanted to speak after Council Member Soria. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Council President. I just wanted to ask um, the city manager because I did um, see some of the, I think the news story that was posted on the auditor. So I wanted to follow up um, and see what, if there was some follow up to why um, the process happened the way that it did. Um, and can this council, can you, you guys come back and give a presentation in terms of what is the process? Um, I think that we need to be consistent and we need to, as a community, we need to be transparent about what is happening. So um, I don't know if there was more details than what was shared out in the press, um, but from your guys' perspective, I just wanna get an update on where we're at with the auditor and what happened. I would ask um, the city attorney, uh, Doug, given the pending litigation <clears throat> surrounding the comment, is this something that we should save for a future closed session? Well, any details of the matter specific to the matter could be discussed in closed session. As far as process, I mean, we could discuss that in open session. Yeah, and I, I want to point out, though, uh, in 2017, when the independent police auditor um, resolution went to council, um, it was the, an annual report that the um, Office of Independent Review was supposed to produce. But when John Gliotta came on board, he demanded that a quarterly report be produced for um, just the sake of keeping the public engaged. Um, I will say that John um, it works very independently from my office and the police um, department. Uh, his office isn't even in either of our buildings. And so um, John has been very clear about even in the last report, um, I, I don't want to get into specifics because of the litigation, but I do welcome the opportunity for John to come and speak with you all. I know that he has reached out to many of your offices. We can do a workshop about the process of his review of cases in PD and what's included in his quarterly report. We're happy to do that. And maybe that will answer your questions moving forward. And in the meantime, we can meet with you individually with Doug in the room as well. Well, I think I think for purpose of the public, I think that it's important that people understand what is the process and the role. So I, I think that kind of in light of all the circumstances uh, that we do have a workshop and you guys present, you know, what is the role? What's the process? Who makes those decisions? Um, you know, because I think from the comments that I made, um, it, he made the, the unilateral decision 
to not disclose even though he had finalized certain things because of what his impression was. And so I don't know if that's the best way um, to go about this. And I think that there's value in the council having a discussion if that process needs to be modified when it comes to uh, releasing information. The last thing that I wanna do is um, continue to perpetuate uh, the, the conversation that we are eroding trust um, with our police department, um, given the context of what is happening nationally and then the impacts of what has occurred in the past um, for, our, for our police department. So I think that it's incumbent upon us that if we feel strongly about building trust in our community and addressing those challenges head on that we're fully transparent with the public. I, I wanna be clear about a couple of things. We're happy to do a workshop. I'll get that scheduled for the next, um, uh, next meeting sometime in October. But I, I wanna be clear about something. Um, John has the full support of my office. He has been nothing but honest and full of integrity since day one. Um, I watched his response to the police department or to the reform commission last week and his answer could not have been more honest about why he is waiting till October to release the findings, uh, his findings of that in particular case. And so that to me is the epitome of integrity. He could not have been more honest about that decision. And we will have a workshop, we'll go over his whole process. He, is, he will be very happy to do so. And I'll and, work and get something scheduled for October. And I appreciate that city manager, however, um, I appreciate that he was honest and that he was upfront, but had there been no commission, we wouldn't have known. And the only reason that that that's came to actually, light was that's actually, not, that's actually not true. And John can speak to that. And his, his last report actually showed that that uh, information about that particular case and that it was closed and, and his report in October will give more details. And, and hopefully maybe we can time his workshop with the release of his next report. And I, and I, I know is, it has the last quarter report that was issued in July, and, and I'm happy to meet with you with him in the meantime to go over that. So, so city manager, if you would allow me, um, who, who does the auditor report to? He reports to me in a very independent capacity. I do not direct him. So he reports to you, but you have no responsibility over his actions? He is, um, Doug, do you want, do you have the resolution about the, the role of the independent auditor handy? So I'm not, uh, I don't have that in front of me, but I, um, I meet with John and he updates me on all of his community meetings and his, and his reports, but he is not, he does not get any direction from my office. He is, okay. is truly the definition of independent okay. and it should be, it should be. He should not be directed by me or the police chief. My other question is, do, do, do you know, um, since he updates you and he reports to you, do you know why he's choosing mid-October to release the report since he's been sitting on it for months now? Why it's, can't he release it today? It's in his next quarter report. It's, it's, it, it, October is when his next report is due out. So is there anything that keeps him from releasing it today? Um, I... It's he does a quarterly report. This is the October quarterly report that's being released. He's packaging it with that like he would. It would be inconsistent if he did anything different. Well, he's already done something different, which is sit on a report for four months. So my question is, people want to see the report. Is there anything legally or at your direction that keeps him from releasing that report today versus mid-October? So can we direct the... Can we direct staff to release the report if we no. know it's out Council there? Be, 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 before we get to direction, I just want to know from, from the folks who supervise um, the auditor or from our legal counsel, whether there's anything that keeps them from releasing the report before mid-October. Council, first of all, this is not an item on the agenda, so we're, we're limited to what we can do here. Uh, second of all, the manager directs the independent auditor but that's in a sort of a procedural capacity. She should not be directing substantively what he says, but she can direct him, do your job. She is his boss, okay. uh, but she, she would not be directing, say this or don't say this. Understood. I understand. Uh, Council Mayor Carbossi. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a comment on another issue, but on this issue, um, this is an extremely serious issue. I think there's a lot of good questions. We had, you know, Matthew called and I appreciate the comments people have made. I think we have to get clarification 
before we start going public about our, our, our interpretation of things. I think we as a council, and I would encourage the city manager to let the council, if we can do it in a closed session, as representatives of the people, meet directly and ask those questions so we can be better informed. Because the, the last thing we want, we have this great independent police auditor position that was created and it was a fight to get there. We want to make sure we don't erode the integrity of that role. And I don't recall this situation happening before. This is a, a learning experience. But we also have to ensure if policies weren't followed, that we correct those policies so it doesn't happen again. That's my request. <laughs> All right. Council President, can I just add um, to um, Council Member Carbossi's comments? I think that he he's right, um, not just the council, but I think the public also. Um, so a refresher in terms of, you know, then the city manager has agreed that to come on, to have a workshop so people know exactly what, what are the expectations and that we do review what are the policies and protocols because if something wasn't followed, then we should rectify. Fair enough. All right, it looks like we've gotten the, the, the tone of everybody's comments. We will uh, put a, uh, Council Member uh, Bredefield, do you have the floor? Yeah, Next I, a couple of things. Uh, you know, at the, at the uh, comments uh, that were expressed by some folks, um, our police chief was maligned. I mean, he was called uh, a racist. And, you know, I happen to personally uh, know uh, Chief Hall, and he's the furthest thing from a racist. And I know it's in vogue to uh, people you disagree with, you, you call a racist. I, I often tell people, uh, half joking, that, uh, you know, I spent over 35 years working as a clinical psychologist in this community, have uh, what I think has always been very respected in the private sector as well as at the VA hospitals, I've uh, been an honor to work with veterans and always was respected. And then I entered the arena and I found out that I'm a racist, a white supremacist and a death merchant. Uh, who knew? I didn't know. Uh, but uh, that's what happens when you enter the uh, political arena. You get called names when people disagree with you. And I take exception. I mean, I've got strong shoulders. I've, I've gotten used to it. But I take great exception when uh, they call uh, somebody like uh, Chief Hall uh, a racist who's the furthest thing from it. He spent his life uh, defending people in this community and supporting them and protecting them. And so I think it's, uh, it's a disgrace when people uh, do that because they disagree or they don't like phraseology in a, um, in a, in a press release. Uh, so I, I think it's frankly disgusting and a disgrace. As far as this thing um, that happened with Mr. Gliata, I also want to say that, uh, you know, that he is also a man of integrity. I think he, he probably made a mistake in not releasing something that should have been released. I, I think things should always be released. I understand he was concerned, but uh, those things ought to be released. But I don't think we should, again, uh, attack and malign people uh, simply because we, we disagree with them. Uh, I am in support of uh, trying to release whatever report is there and doing it expeditiously. I think we should do it quickly. Uh, I don't think we need to wait for the next newsletter or release or his quarterly report. Uh, so I do support that, again, because I believe in transparency, and I think the public always has a right to know. Uh, but uh, Mr. Gliotta is a tremendous man of integrity, and I take exception when people attack his character as well. Thank you, Council Member Redfield. Uh, Council Member Council President. Council President. I can quickly yes. make a comment before you comment. Council Manager, that's okay? On this matter because i think maybe it'll okay all right um, yeah. thank you mr president i had another comment um, that i wanted to finish up um talking separately now about the statement of the police chief i did want to mention something um this is a very different era in our country i know it's an election year it's an era of cancel culture um and even like you know i i tend to be very careful watching the news today because everything is so negative it influences me and I end up speaking without listening. And this is a lesson for myself. And one thing my, my mom always told me is God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. And I need to learn to listen. I listen to the statements of the people that called in. And I just wanna share some of my experiences. I've been very fortunate to be a council member. I've gotten to know people. When I look at someone, especially in someone that, like my colleagues or someone in a position where they can actually help people, I don't look at the color of their skin. I look at what's in their heart. Now I've read this statement several times by the police chief. And I try to understand how someone else may interpret it. And I know that we all have our own feelings about this issue. I'm very angry at what happened to Breonna Taylor. 
And I'll tell you what, I know Chief Hall's very angry about that too, because I've talked to him about it. And what I will tell you is that when reading the statement, you can pick and choose something that you want to use and say, well, this person's bad because of that statement. But that doesn't mean that's what they actually meant when they wrote it. So I'm going to read the very last sentence, because for me, this is a call to action and a reminder for our police officers, because our police officers, and we have white police officers, Latino police officers, black police officers, um, uh, uh, Asian police, not that it should matter, but we have a growing more diverse police force. But I, when we had the George Floyd protest because of the murder of George Floyd, they were out there making sure people were safe. We were worried about other protesters from the other side coming in and clashing, and they didn't want any of that. They wanted people to exercise their rights and the other aspect is our chaplaincy went out and actually fed protesters to make sure they were fed safe and hydrated because it was, you know, it was because of the timing. So I'm going to read the last sentence. And this goes to the point of community policing, which is the future for this community. We need to get out of our cars and engage with our community, treat everyone with dignity and respect. Let them know that we are still here to serve and will never abandon them. We are Fresno and this is our family. So that to me is the crux of his message. That was his intent. And I thank him for that intent because we have to move forward to that model. And I know what's in the heart of our police chief. I've said many times before, he's very duty bound. He's also approachable. If I know that he does listen when he hears things and he is meeting with the community. So I appreciate the people calling in, letting us know as your representatives how you feel. Thank God in our community, we aren't like other communities, but I know this council is very committed to ensuring this city doesn't fall and that this city provides justice for all and we and provides safety for all. So thank you. City Manager, would you like to say anything before we move on? I was just going to say that I will work with John and do a workshop on either October 15th or the 22nd. And I'm learning that his actual report for that particular case is not finished. Um, and so I'll update you all um, as soon as I know what that looks like. Uh, but there, right, is a process, there is a process that we follow where we, the, the report does get legal review as well. So, so, so City Manager, let's, let's, let's plan for the workshop on the 15th and let's also be crystal clear about what the report being complete is because um, it, it seems to me that it's quite a bit of mixed messaging. So, um, you know, the video I saw, it, it was complete months ago. So let's just make sure that when we get to the workshop and that the, uh, the auditor is crystal clear about the, when the report was completed and um, when it will be released. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Butterfield? Yeah, thank you, Council President. Just, just one final thing. You know, in our community, we've had uh, 38, I believe it's 38 murders uh, to date. Uh, we are far surpassing what uh, occurred last year. All across our city, uh, uh, people are being killed. We hear about uh, uh, gunfire every day. Um, I understand there's been an 80% increase in shootings since April, a 70% increase in stabbings. And uh, I think this is really what we need to be also focused on. Uh, our police are the ones out there on the front lines having to deal with this. I mean, there is gunfire uh, all over the place. And uh, we need to make our citizens safe. We need to uh, continue to give uh, the police the resources to deal with this. Um, we're, we're a city that's having a lot of problems and we're not the only city. Uh, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is when you release uh, 20,000 uh, criminals and you have no bail policies and, and the police will tell you that. I mean, they've arrested people for attempted murder and they've been out within five hours. Uh, you can't have a safe city that way. And uh, so uh, we rely on our police uh, to make us sa uh, safe. And we all know that. And I'm grateful uh, to them. And I'm grateful to uh, leaders in our community, our community leaders all over uh, who are trying to deal with this now in uh, Southwest, Southeast Fresno, uh, actually throughout the entire city. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're doing uh, a tough work uh, because it can't be just the police who, who help make us safe. Uh, from our pastors to our other community leaders who are uh, fighting to, to keep uh, all of us safe. So um, I think we need to keep that in mind that uh, we, we have some serious, uh, very serious problems facing our, our city. And um, we have to deal with those as well. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Councilmember. We'll go to Councilmember Chavez for a final word on the item. 
Yeah, thank you, President. Um, just wanted to briefly comment on this. I, I appreciate the conversation. I too agree. I think we, I'm looking forward to that uh, October 15th uh, workshop so that we can get more clarity and, and, and really specifics on what this process will look like going forward uh, for when reports are released. Um, if that's the will of the council, um, then maybe we do them monthly, maybe we do them quarterly. Um, I'm open to that conversation. But I, I spoke to the chief yesterday and, and I spoke to him because I, I, I had to make a, a statement with regards to the merchants on the Kings Canyon Ventura corridor. As we know, those are the majority of them are Latino um, small business owners. Um, they've been hit with so many burglaries um, these past couple of months to the point where you have COVID situation. They're struggling with the shutdown. Um, they've had to lay off employees, um, cut back on hours, and now we have criminals taking advantage of the situation and burglarizing these facilities. And, and I say that as an example because I actually checked some of the stats, and I, that's why I called Chief Hall. There have been 600 criminals released back into our city uh, since April, and that's something that we have to reconcile as a city. Uh, more importantly, the conversation that we're going to have is what do we expect from our police officers? Do we want them to be proactive and go out there or do we want them to wait for calls for service? Um, that's that's going to be a, a, a very robust um, and I, I anticipate controversial converse, conversation, but let's let's keep in mind that, you know, and, and, and part of this problem has been the false promise of Prop 47 and 57, if we're being honest, where the rehabilitation part of this conversation never happened. And, and that's a failure on the state's part, right? Where they, they sold us a bag of goods and then did not deliver uh, on the resources. And so now we're left with the local level having to come up with solutions on what our law enforcement is gonna look like. Um, I too support transparency and I support the conversation that we're about to have, um, but let's keep focus on what the big issue is here. And that is the fact that crime, we're in the middle of a crime wave. Um, and that is not a term that I use loosely uh, because that's how it's being described here in our city. And we need to really step up and, and prioritize public safety. Um, that's a conversation to be had, but I'm looking forward to that conversation. Thank you, council member. And with, uh, with that, um, let's stay focused on what's on the agenda. Um, I think we, we've pushed the bounds of the Brown Act and getting a little off topic. So as council vice president would say, let's, let's get back to business and stay in our lanes. So with that, let's stick to the, um, items as identified. We'll go with one S, um, the item that was pulled from consent for further discussion. It's a five-year agreement with Sencal uh, on a re revolving loan fund. Um, so, uh, Member Carbosti, before I go to you, I'd like um, staff to present the item. So, um, we'll turn it over to staff and I think Director Room 2125, if you can present the item to the council. Good morning, council members, council president, Kelly Trevino with the economic development um, team. Um, I am here to answer any questions that you have. Uh, as you stated, this is in regards to our current five-year agreement contract with CENCAL Business Finance Group. So last year, we brought to you the agreement with CENCAL. Um, you approved it. It was signed last year in November. Um, so we have another four plus years left on that current agreement. So this action that's before you right now is just to amend that agreement to include this CARES Act revolving loan fund. So we were invited, um, due to our A-plus rating with the EDA and our current good standing um, with our current revolving loan fund, we were invited by the EDA to apply for a non-competitive grant, a revolving loan fund grant. This is CARES Act money that can only be used for this revolving loan fund. Um, we applied, we were successful, and now we need to, uh, we would like to amend our agreement with CENCAL to also administer this grant, this grant, this revolving loan fund grant. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions that you have, but again, this does not extend their current agreement. There are still four, months, four years left of that agreement, and this will not change the term, the, the length of that agreement. I'll make a motion to approve, Council President. Second. Um, there's a motion of questions from the Council. Council, I'm sorry, you have the floor. Just have, um, 
couple questions. One, so this is the only group that could um, essentially disperse the funds. Is that what you're saying that that's what the grant said? Um, that was in our application. We proposed to have them um, also administer this grant due to the unusual and compelling urgency of the funds. We have 24 months to get all of the funds loaned out. They are already set up for this um, so that they can get started right away. They already have about five prospects uh, in the queue that are interested in the funding. Um, so we're excited to have them and, and hope to have them get started right away in getting this funding out. We will lose any funding that does not get loaned out within 24 months. Okay. Um, what kind of businesses are we looking at um, in terms of uh, the businesses that are covered under the grant? Oh, it's um, any what are the what are the amounts? And you said there's five prospect businesses. Can you share a, share with us? Yes. Who are the prospective businesses? So it must be a business within the city of Fresno. Um, it must be a business that is having difficulty obtaining other funding, and they have to show a nexus that they are have experienced hardship due to COVID, and that they're going to use the funds to um, to respond to the crisis in some way and to further grow their business and um, stay viable in this new uh, COVID environment that we're in. Um, there are four that I'm aware of. I know there were five, but four that I were aware of, I'm aware of that uh, businesses that were interested and possibly eligible for this funding, um, a counseling business, a dry cleaner, a Southeast Fresno daycare center, and a West Fresno clinic. Um, that have expressed interest and, and would be potentially um, eligible for this. Uh, are nonprofits also eligible? No, they are not. So they're all just business business. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, how are they going to make sure that our Spanish speaking Hmong um, type of businesses also have the ability to uh, get these um, loans, excuse me? Right, so um, CENCAL is going to be partnering with a number of our, our community organizations. Um, they're actually gonna be developing a, uh, not a finder's fee, but a um, referral fee. So uh, they will meet with the different community organizations, let them know that there will be a referral fee offered. So if, if a referral from one of those organizations results in a closed loan, they will be uh, able to obtain that referral fee. So it will, it will help them um, to get the word out as well. What is the um, rate that um, they're going to be able to loan out? Uh, prime plus 2%. So we're, we're trying to make this as attractive as possible. Um, and we're waiving the loan fees as well for the businesses. How, um, how long will it have to be before the business has to pay back the loan? Um, it depends on the type of loan. Uh, no more than 20 years if it's a real estate loan, but typically five, three to five or up to seven years for the full amortization of the loan. For this particular loan though, this mm -hmm. COVID, okay. Mm -hmm. I think those are all my questions for now, thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, I do have a few questions myself. What is the current prime rate right now? I believe it's 3.25% about 3%. So um, the additional 2%, who, who set that rate? Is that the, the granting entity or is that the organization? Um, we set that rate with CENCAL. Our current revolving loan fund starts at 2.5% prime plus 2.5% and goes up depending on the size of the loan. So a larger loan qualifies for a lower uh, percentage. But with the CARES Act revolving loan fund, we're setting it at a fixed prime plus two to make it more attractive. Why don't, since, since this is CARES Act money and it's supposed to be going out and people have to demonstrate that they were impacted, why are we adding an additional 2% to, to the prime? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's up for discussion. The, the goal is to create this revolving loan fund. So as the money's paid back, we have a larger pool of funds to make available to businesses. Yeah, I, I understand that. And I understand that in our traditional loan, we do that intentionally to have money to give out in the next five years. But CARES Act is different. CARES Act is supposed to get out immediately. It's not supposed to generate us interest or generate SENCAL interest or generate 
anybody interest it's supposed to help businesses so so from my perspective um I, I, I'd rather we, we go and not add an additional 2%, you know, interest rate on these businesses that are really struggling um, to get by. So um, I'd be supportive of the item if the makers of the motion will simply set the rate at the prime um, and, and not add the additional 2% interest rate for businesses. I would, um, I would agree with you. I think um, given the, the time and the moment, I think it's an opportunity for folks to get lower rent, I mean, lower interest loans um, that are struggling. I don't think that if it's not required, we shouldn't re require an additional 2%. I think that that is fair um, given the circumstances. So. And, and we're willing to take that back to the EDA and as long as they don't have a problem with it, I, you know, that's, that's at your will. And then also, what about um, the types of um, businesses that can be prioritized? Is there a strategy or is it just point blank whoever they, they get to decide? Well, like I said, it's not, nonprofit businesses are not eligible, but other than that, um, we, uh, we want to get this money out, it, the, the money fully out within two years. So it's anyone that's eligible and can demonstrate that they have been negatively impacted by COVID and are going to use the money to to help to survive in this environment. So, so, so Councilwoman, if, if you're okay, I, I'd like to make uh, an amendment to the motion to um, remove the additional 2% interest rate if the granting authority um, agrees to that, the funding authority. Uh, Councilmember Carbasi? You said if they they agree to it. I yeah. want to fully understand. I, I want to help people. We, we You know, you and I, yourself and Councilman Soria, we did the small business uh, grant program. But I want to understand if there is no income coming in so that we can pr have that pot and provide for other businesses, what happens there? Well, um, in, in this case, Mike, this organization already gets a pot of money from us every year that mm -hmm. they loan out and they get interest and that pot continues to grow and fund itself, right? This just is an additional pot Fish. of money from CARES Act. So um, I, I don't think we should be making money off the CARES Act. I think we should just put it out at the cheapest rate possible, especially if the funding or um, uh, funding entity agrees to that. So um, I, if, if you recall, in most of our discussions around small business relief, the, the federal government has said, you have to put it in the form of a grant. You have to not make it difficult, don't put conditions, put it out. So I, I just like to give people an additional you know, break if, if if there's no need for it, why charge them an additional 2%? We already have a revolving fund with them. And at any time, this council can say, take one time money and put more money into that revolving fund. Got it. So we're, we'll check with legal to make sure it's kosher. And then of course, you, your, your, your motion was- My, your, your my motion is, is, is simply- it's contingent upon there. Yes, um, um, amend the item to approve it um, at the prime rate only um, contingent on the funding entity um, of, um, authorizing it. So, well, so what if they say they don't want to do it? That's the thing. Like, I think that if it's not required, we should say this should be I mean, the rate. The funding agency is not CENCAL, but the federal government who's giving us the money. But, so mm -hmm. it, it was just told to us, though, that we can do it, that that's just being added because that was their agreement. They they just indicated that they wanted to confirm with EDA that that's possible. Okay. So, so my attempt is very simple. If the EDA, which is a federal government, doesn't require the additional 2%, then we should not add the additional 2% to grantees and, um, and move on with that. So that's my amendment to approve the item contingent on not charging the additional 2% if the funding entity, EDA, in this case, approves of that. Council President, I'll accept that amendment. Thank you. Uh, Mike, are you good with that as a second maker of the motion? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, let me go to um, public comment on the item. Anybody in the public wishing to comment on this revolving loan fund uh, opportunity for small businesses? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. If there's no other comments, we'll go to roll call. Excuse me, Councilmember Bredefell? Yes. Councilmember Chavez? Yes. Councilmember Esparza? Aye. Councilmember Cravasi? Aye. Councilmember Soria? Yes. Vice President Capriolio? Yes. President Arias? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, Council, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda. That'll be 4B as in boy, an a bill for introduction, adoption, uh, adopting an, as an emergency order of business is essential to local e e e economy. Sorry. Council sorry. President, I'm sorry, the custom agenda is incorrect. 4B on the regular agenda is the PBID item. Oh. Okay, so what item are we on then? Since yeah, four B is resolution authorizing and directing the city manager to conduct a competitive solicitation process for a consultant to explore a property-based improvement district for Central and Southern Blackstone Avenue, and that is subject to veto. Yeah, Council President, that's my that's my item. Um, okay. So the oh. outstanding items are four B and four D. So I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and proceed with four B, which is the PBID item. Uh, th this is just another uh, another one of our efforts on Blackstone and our redevelopment efforts, uh, property-based business improvement district. Uh, so we allocated some dollars in the budget uh, this summer uh, in order to explore what a PBID would look like on Blackstone to conduct outreach. Uh, and so this is just initiating that process and having the administration uh, take the appropriate steps uh, to uh, find the uh, consultants and, and get the projects going. Uh, so I do wanna make a motion to approve with, with one amendment, um, really just to be more specific. I, the language indicates that it's the central southern part of Blackstone. Uh, what I want to be uh, clear on is that we're looking at the uh, portion of Blackstone that is targeted in the southern uh, Blackstone mobility strategy. So roughly from Dakota down uh, through the 180, uh, that portion of Blackstone. I'll uh, second that. All right, let me go out to public. Is there any member of the public wishing to address the item on the correct 4B, which is authorizing the director the directing the city manager to conduct a competitive solicitation process. Um, I will go out to the public. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the council. We'll go to roll call. Council member Bredefeld? Yes. Council member Chavez? Yes. Council member Esparza? Aye. Council member Krabassi? Aye. Council member Soria? Yes. Vice President Capriolio? Yes. President Arias? Yes. The next item is 4D as in David. Um, it is a resolution declaring that all residents of the city of Fresno have been uh, demontally impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. Um, council, um, this is a recommendation by our legal counsel, our mayor, and our council committee on COVID. Essentially, by authorizing this resolution, uh, we make it easier when there's food distribution events taking place that we don't have to get a affidavit that every single person um, is, you know, impacted by COVID. So. It makes the distribution of our food relief efforts easier for residents who are lining up and trying to get some food and um, resources from the city. Uh, let me take it. Do I have a motion to approve the item? Motion to approve, yeah. but you have a question for it, though. Sure. A motion by Member Chavez, um, second by Member Soria. Let me go to the public for a moment. Anybody in the public wishing to address the, this item? Does it look like we have any today? And Brandy, Brandy's hand up. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. Brandy, you are allowed to address the council on this item. Uh, very briefly, I, I, I just want to uh, thank you again for um, every effort that you guys are making to provide resources for our community during this time. Um, and thank you very much for that, as well as all the other items today that have been done in support of our community. Thank you. Great. We'll bring it back to council. Uh, Councilman Chavez, you have the floor. Yeah, this is just a question for for Doug. And obviously, you know, we know that the pandemic has hit, you know, the majority of of, of the city, and 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 procedurally, we're working on this. But uh, there is the concern that there are people that have not been directly affected by um, COVID would want to use this clause to um, take advantage of resources or. Uh, forbearance. So, Doug, um, with the language that we have here, does that ensure that people that have not been um, affected by COVID don't invoke this and, and take advantage of this? I sent you some language that um, I had shut I think, to you and Katie. Uh, would that be appropriate to include to clarify that, or, or does that do it for this um, ordinance? Well, even without clarification, uh, I would say that, you know, people would still need to comply with the terms of any specific uh, grant or program that we have. In other words, this does not open up every program to anybody without 
the qualification required for that specific program. Right. So, so that language that we included for the the CARES Act funding in Section Three um, would would that be appropriate, or, or are you comfortable with this uh, language that we currently have in place? So that and here's the example I want to give. You know, the the person making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars that refuses to pay their rent or utility cannot invoke this clause uh, because obviously they haven't been affected. Right. No, we would not need to change it for that to be the case. Okay. In other I words, just, uh, this does not open up every program for everybody. This is more okay. general. Got it. I just wanted to get that on the record and make sure that we're 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 good on that. Correct. All right, Council. With that, um, roll call, please. Councilmember Bredefield. Yes. Councilmember Chavez. Yes. Councilmember Sparza. Aye. Councilmember Kravatsky. Aye. Councilmember Soria. Sorry, yes. Okay, thanks. Vice President Capriolio? Yes. And President Arias? Yes. All right, Council. It looks like we're done with our agenda for this morning. We will go into lunch break. I'll see you back at 1 o'clock for the 1 o'clock item. After that item, we'll um, reconvene for closed session. Council, Mem uh, Council President, if I yes. may. Uh, I have a, a 1 o'clock medical appointment for my $17,000 new college shot to keep me breathing. Uh, so I don't think I'll be here at that time. And then I have a 3.30 appointment to uh, excise some, a little bit of cancer off my back. So I might not be able to get back here this afternoon. That's fair. It, Thank you for being here in person today. Well, I, I appreciate it. And I think that was the fastest meeting on record. Yes. Year. <laughs> we, we, we created our council vice president for the quick meeting and I do thank you guys for allowing me to take a break today. Um, we did do the groundbreaking for the, um, you know, kingdom of Asia, which is going to be an amazing um, addition to the Fresno and Chaffee Zoo. So thank you for allowing me that break and council. If, uh, if you want to take a break next meeting, let me know. Okay. <laughs> the meeting after that. All right. <laughs> we'll see you uh, back at one o'clock and we'll see you next time, Council Vice President. Uh, good luck you. with your medical appointments. I all appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank all. you. Oh, good luck, Paul. Thank good you. Luck. Thank you. We'll buy you some time. So I'm just gonna see if council member Sparza can chime in so we can get going. Thank you, council member. Council member Chavez, I think you're in and out on your video. So we're gonna go ahead and, and proceed with the item. Um, the next item is the one o'clock um, item. And uh, I will go ahead and share my screen really quick so we can start that process. One second here. Uh, and Council, Council President, uh, just a reminder, this is for introduction today, yes. right? Mm -hmm. We're taking a vote. Yeah. So yeah. let me just get here really quick. Um, so as a reminder for the public, uh, the City Council adopted, uh, initiated the process of this item approximately a year ago. Today is an introduction of the item. It will be heard for consideration of approval on October 15th. Um, we are simply going to hear the item today. There will be no vote on the item, and we will also take some public comments on this item. As a quick reminder for everyone, um, in 2019, we conducted a pilot inspection program of ABC license holders, um, and we identified a lot of violations, either because people didn't know what their CUPs um, outlined or um, they were not following their CUPs. Um, as you know, we've gone to a point of significant saturation, so I'll try to go through this quickly to not delay uh, the rest of the meeting. Uh, but there's a long history of how we got here, everything from the grandfathering of all the CUPs in 1993 when Mayor Patterson was here, and uh, we had a different group of folks in the planning department, as well as you know several um, approvals that took place after that period of time. Um, it's been very clear and national news that we have significant licenses and saturation in the city. We also have a significant amount of DUIs in the city. Um, in 2012, um, our youth in the city started to advocate 
for a difference in policy um, led by the Youth Leadership Institute, which joins us as a public uh, speaker today. We also got advocacy from the association that represent convenience stores as well and gas stations in 2013. And the city did take some initial action in 2016 with some limitations on um, signage for storefronts of those having C um, ABC licenses. Um, and of course, um, they've made some attempts to try and get their hands around this effort that had failed in the past. And since then, we have been engaged in a couple of lawsuits as a result of utilizing the public convenience provision for adding additional licenses in already saturated areas. So it's been a long journey. Um, th this again just reminds us that in April of last year, the council did initiate the process um, uh, to initiate this, this work in a unanimous vote. Um, this is the evidence of the highest concentration of alcohol licenses in the state of California. Um, as you can see, the state um, identifies a percentage of one license for every 2,500 residents. It's no secret that in some of our neighborhoods, we have one license for every 300 residents. So the saturation has been taking place for years and they all, of course, result in a lot of um, calls for service from our public safety um, resources. Um, the Youth Leadership Institute has done their part in doing the research, surveying, talking to the uh, residents and advocating for changes in policy. So I, I do wanna give them a shout out. They've done a really good job of staying focused um, whether young people come in and out of the program, they have continued to carry this you know, flag on asking for reforms that improve our neighborhoods. Um, the overall goal of, of this policy that's being just introduced today for, for a hearing is um, to improve the neighborhood quality of life while supporting the small businesses that have been operating with the licenses that have been given in the past. So, I want to be really clear that we are trying to ensure that we set a citywide policy that leads to a decrease in saturation over time versus a the heavy hand of government, as my colleague would say, that results in you know shutting down businesses of overnight. So for existing businesses, this would not result in any difference of their current operation. Um, they would continue to operate as is. They would just not, does not require them to apply for a new conditional use permit. It also does not, um, that thousand foot buffer does not apply to them. Because if you could imagine if you've had a store in the same location for 20 years and the city asked you to move it 500 feet um, somewhere else, it would result in a huge devastation to your business. It does um, have every business in the city participating in the city inspection program that we are co-developing with the association. For new businesses, it allows for new licenses to continue in the city um, while ensuring that new businesses and development help us reduce saturation over time by buying additional licenses in saturated areas and retiring those licenses. It does set a 5% signage um, limit for all businesses new and existing. It also provides a thousand foot buffer from sensitive locations in um, saturated areas. Um, and then, of course, new businesses would also participate in the um, city inspection program that's designed to be proactive and educational. So everybody knows what are the ever-changing rules at the state and local level, so their businesses continue to be in compliance. Um, as a result, um, we, of this work, we also recommended the establishment of the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act Committee. Um, their goal is gonna be to review the implementation of this act advise us on any changes, evaluate the citywide ratio of alcohol licenses to ensure that if we are making significant strides, we make adjustments to the policy and not just wait for it to occur. So um, the resolution that is included in your backup material um, requires that this committee, six months prior to the city reaching the ratio of the state average, come back with recommended revisions to the act to ensure that there's enough time to put those changes in place. Um, uh, as you know, it takes quite a bit of, of time to, to get through the city process. The, the membership of the committee would be four members of the public appointed by council members in saturated areas, three members appointed by the association, one member appointed by the mayor, and then one member um, appointed by a youth organization. In this case, uh, Youth Leadership Institute is our partner organization. So this membership, um, this committee would be advising us on the implementation, 
Um, also, um, this committee would get referrals of any business that was identified for violations. W that business would be referred to this committee for advice before the city takes any disciplinary or re revocation procedure. So we're trying to make sure we have the right system in place to educate, inform, and support small businesses before they get to the point of having to deal with a city fine or consequences um, that could be as severe as a revocation of a CUP. Um, with that, um, the last time that we were before you in April of 2019, we committed to complete, completing the environmental uh, review that was done, um, developing the inspection program, which we have um, started that process with the association. Um, it's gone through every uh, district implementation committee um, with no opposition from the committees. It's gone to the County Airport Line Use Commission and the City Planning Commission. Both entities um, supported um, and approved um, the, these, uh, uh, this act as drafted. And now um, we're back to you um, for a hearing. I wanted to also be very clear about the non-substantial revisions that we've made since um, it's been heard through all these committees. Um, as you can imagine, once we publish um, the final document through the Planning Commission, we get a lot of additional feedback and we try to incorporate as much feedback and provide clarity and um, identify things that we didn't think about a year ago when we started this process. The market, COVID, a lot of things have shifted. So we did add some additional um, clarifications. These are the sections. We added some re references of exemptions listed on section D2. We also are allowing the establishments that expand their floor area for non-alcohol related retail um, to retain their existing CUP. So I wanna spend a moment just on that. Um, what we're trying to do is um, ensure that a current business who wants to expand their business but doesn't wanna expand the area of alcohol sales can, can do so because we want that reinvestment back into the area without having to go through the process of uh, buying additional licenses or having to update their CUP or amend it. Um, we also included some um, restrictions around um, some language clarifying that if you're an establishment near a trail system that's not adjacent to public parks, then that's not a sensitive use. So we wanted to clear that up for some of our new development areas. We also included some language around the 500 foot distance between establishments. Um, if you're not in a saturated area of the city, then the 500 foot limit would apply. The thousand foot limit applies if you are in a saturated area, because we want to make sure that we're not continuing to oversaturate the areas that are very saturated already. Um, additionally, um, we put in some language to clarify that if you're an operating business in good standing and you are switching ownership of the business or transferring the license from a franchisee, that this, you wouldn't have to go through a process of buying additional licenses. Because again, we want to make sure that we're cognitive of the existing businesses and allowing them to improve. We also added some language to ensure that if you're making improvements to your business, for example, if you're a gas station and you're replacing your canopy, if you're replacing windows, you're making improvements to your building, that this um, process wouldn't apply to you because we want that reinvestment back into the area. We also added some additional language around four packs to three packs. So these are all the changes. Again, they are non-substantial revisions, but they do strengthen the act and they provide us um, the, the clarification that a lot of our uh, stakeholders, stakeholders have been asking for. Um, so just uh, again to the council, our next step is to, um, now that we've um, completed the year process, now that we've gotten feedback from a lot of stakeholders, um, we're hearing it today, our, our intent is to take the next step and consider adoption on August, uh, October 15th. Between now and October 15th, we're going to continue to obtain feedback from stakeholders and you know, strengthen the, the policy and make whatever adjustments we feel would be in the best interest of the city and of all the stakeholders that we interact with. So with that, Council, um, if I may, I'm going to unshare my screen now so that I can go to a public comment um, before we bring it back to the Council. And again, this is an item that does not require a vote at this time as is just simply an introduction. Um, let me go to the first speaker, um, Andy. You are being unmuted. You can address the council on this item. 
Hey, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, uh, I hope uh, everybody's uh, safe down there in the city uh, during these COVID time. Uh, I want to make uh, a few comments down here. Uh, uh, we were very pleased to work with the council members, uh, uh, Mr. Arias and uh, Nelson's and uh, Luis Chari's office worked over almost a year on this one. Uh, there were a lot of different things could have hurt uh, a lot of small businesses. We do appreciate them bringing us on the table and taking our input. Uh, there are a lot of corrections made to this one. Uh, the, we came to the city seven, eight years back about uh, drunk, we were being the drunkest city in, in the entire nation. Uh, we came again the next year, and we were asking city council at that time to make some strong measures to clean our image and how our next generations are coming up. We are business people. We looked at the city interests. We gave our input, looking at both sides. Uh, I do believe that uh, some of these things uh, in three to four years time, the oversaturation, uh, it could bring that issue back to uh, close and the city could go back and uh, start doing business as other uh, cities are doing it. Eight, nine years back, when we were coming down and restricting and asking people having four liquor stores at one corner, four gas station for four corners, is not gonna help anybody. Uh, there, there were plenty of other choices down there, but city had adopted whatever they did and we can't go back and change it, uh, but uh, I do appreciate uh, that when lawmakers and legislators bring people on table, and especially the people in the businesses and people who are going to be impacted by their decision, I do appreciate and I do welcome all of you guys to add those people back on to the table to take their inputs and then do the best what is the best for the city. We are not expert of what city needs to do, we are an expert of our industry and how to solve the problems of the city. Um, with a bunch of these changes, uh, uh, we, are, we are supporting it as whatever it takes uh, from our side. And city council as a council members and team, you guys would have to do whatever other languages you would have to make sure to protect um, uh, any other business or for, for, to protect the city. Thank you, Andy. I, and thank you for your um, year long effort and all the means that we've had to engage in over the last year um, and all your members. I know uh, prior to COVID, there was eight, 10 of us in the same room for hours and hours going through um, every potential um, challenge that we saw. And you guys have continued to be at the forefront um, of putting the city's best interest at hand. Um, with that, let me go to the next speaker, George Beal. George, um, I think you're in meeting now, you have the floor. George, can you hear us? Mr. President, members of the City Council, I'm George Beal. My address is 1175 Shaw Avenue, City of Clovis. Uh, I'd like to address a couple of items on the Responsible Neighborhood Market Act. And after listening to uh, Mr. Arias' uh, opening statement, some of the items may be on there already that he has addressed. But uh, let me just uh, go through it. So one thing I'm a big fan of is enforce the codes and rules and regulations that are on the books. I think everybody tries to do something new and uh, they've already had the tools to do it. All of the items the city is trying to change and enforce is defined in the California Business and Professional Code and in, the, in existing and new ordinances. Speaking with ABC, they will only enforce the state law. That's, that's required by the ABC regulations. The state has rules to govern how many licenses for selling beer, wine, and distilled liquors can be granted in a community. Uh, a formula in, that, in the state's business professional code says the number should be one for every 1,250 residents. In the Fresno, that would be like 416 also licenses. Fresno, however, has 468, 52 more than specific by formula of the law. As of 2016, to serve 522 residents. I took that out of what I printed off uh, from the city. I know things have changed since 2016. They 
residents probably increased and the licenses probably increased, but um, we should leave the distances for uh, parks, schools, and that type of item, the 500 feet between for the type 20 and 20 licenses. And uh, the council member said that uh, uh, it's only in saturated, distant, uh, <clears throat> saturated areas now or saturated census tracts, but that really is all of Fresno in most cases. Uh, <clears throat> it should be determined what census tracts exceed the number of licenses allowed and put a plan together to reduce the licenses in those census tracts. <clears throat> and I, I think, you know, rather than paint the city with the whole brush, with a big brush, I think that would be one approach, break it down into smaller, um, a smaller um, project and we can deal with that. If a person wants to build a new facility needs a type 2021 20, license and the census track exceeds the allowable number of licenses, they should be able to buy another license, a license from a census track that's made up of that council person's district if the council person agrees. If there's 15 census tracks or 20 census tracks, uh, that license, instead of limiting it to a census track, which is really pretty tough to buy a license in a census track, it, uh, it's not about the money in many cases. It's that. Thank you, Mr. Beal. Do you want to conclude your comments? Livelihood. And if he gets $250,000 for a, uh, a license and the guy's making 70000 a year out of his business, why would he want to sell? And that, uh, I think that would open it up and help uh, existing business owners to or expansion. This would help reduce licenses within a council person's district. Thank you, Mr. Neal. This has become a very highly regulated business. People that have been in the business for 20, uh, business for many years still try to operate the same way they did 25 years ago. Thank you, Mr. Beal. Thank you for your comments. Uh, the next person is uh, Serge. Serge, you are being unmuted. You have the floor. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody here for working with us. So we. We've been going to the city for a very long time to talk about the proliferation of, of liquor and beer and wine, especially in, in southern, southern Fresno, where in, in some corners you have four stores, sometimes more in one corner, and that's not healthy for the city. Uh, we were the drunkest city for, for many years. We're still in the top 10, and we started this process to clean up the city, to make it less drunk, to make beers that are cheaper than water. We can buy beer at 89 cents. We cannot buy, buy a bottle of water for 89 cents today. And we said enough is enough. We as business people, we came to the city and we approached you for years now. And we said, we need to fix this. And I think we didn't get everything we want. This, this, this bill is very fair. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you for taking taking consideration a lot of our concerns and fears, but I think I think this is a very fair beer, a very fair bill, and, uh, and we would like to proceed with it. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. The next person is Raj. Raj, you are being unmuted. You have the floor. Hey, uh, thank you, council member. Thank you for the giving me the opportunity to speak. There's a two things that I wanted to speak about. Um, is one thing is uh, implementing this um, uh, this in next couple of months. Uh, I would suggest that, uh, or I would request that it should be delayed a little bit because the person like me, we made our investments thinking of that this is gonna, this is not coming as quickly as it did. And one thing is that implementing it a little bit further down and do not uh, impact the what's already in the filing um, with the city. And the second thing is I wanted to talk about the upgrading uh, from license 20 to 21. Um, it will give actually a city an opportunity. If somebody is upgrading the Fresno city license from 20 to 21, it will give the city opportunity to suspend the existing 20. That will, uh, that will help us to reduce those licenses from the city. If, if that particular location upgrade that and the existing 21 is removed out of service that will bring the number down. So those were my two suggestions. Um, 
it will uh, uh, help us for with our investments because we didn't see this going to be as far as I'm thinking that it would be impact uh, implemented within the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you, Raj, for calling in. The next person is uh, Darius Asimi. You have the floor. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon, Council President and, and, and members of the Council. Uh, first of all, uh, I have no interest in alcohol sales or being involved in alcohol sales, but want to see a vibrant Fresno and support removing blight from our city. Uh, in my opinion, a yes vote will monopolize current liquor stores regardless of their blight or condition. I'm glad to see the new amendments that are made about using the current laws on books to look at the uh, conditions of our current liquor stores. Uh, this also, in my opinion, will benefit corporate America and rich folks to the detriment of young entrepreneurs. And I will get, that, get to that in, in a minute. These votes have consequences and will impact our community adversely, in my opinion. The new model for grocery stores is a 4,000 square foot market, could be a convenience store, uh, has fresh produce, deli, sandwich shops, uh, dine-in, that also sells alcohol, uh, from what I understand, to, to make their business model work. These could be built anywhere in the city, including next door to a liquor store. But your act will prohibit these from getting built within a thousand feet of existing uh, stores or liquor uh, places that, that sell alcohol. The general plan calls for a more walkable city. This new type of grocery store that can pop up all over town is more neighborhood friendly. And, and I want to see that. I want to see more grocery stores that, are, that make our community more walkable. And, and local entrepreneurs can, along with uh, national chains, can build these. This act, the way it's, it's set up, will, will, will carve out the local folks to the benefit of corporate America, because the local entrepreneurs won't have won't have the funds or or, or won't be able to afford the two to three hundred thousand dollars needed to buy a license. We're still suffering from the pains that COVID has induced in our city, with many stores closed for good. You're now adding more regulation to stop building grocery stores, especially in underserved areas. There are many shopping centers that are being that are becoming empty except for the liquor and the smoke shop. Imagine someone trying to open up a 4,000 square foot grocery store in Phil or in parts of town that really need the grocery stores um, in the same, same strip mall. This act will prohibit that new grocery store from opening up in an existing strip mall in an underserved area that happens to be next door to an existing liquor store. To, by the way, to get to one in 2,500 ratio, if the math that I've heard from many experts over the last few weeks is correct, you have to retire over 200 licenses. Fresno gives out under 10 licenses per year. So that will take over 20 years to get to this goal. And from what I understand, the state has flexibility whether it's one in 2,500 population versus one in 1,250. Uh, finally, my company and I have built in Fresno for over 40 years. We put our money where our mouth is. We've invested in residential, multifamily, downtown, infill development, university development, and commercial. Your act has a lot of great intentions, and I wholly support the in intent and the spirit of the act to removing blight and removing you know, blighted neighborhoods and, and liquor stores and, and, and that, that fall into, under that category. But uh, it needs more details to make it more fortified and more palatable for our community. I, I urge you to speak with folks that love and care about our city and have the experience and, and make have the right recommendation and make the right recommendations so we don't have unintended consequences that can set our uh, city backwards. Uh, thanks so much for your consideration. Um, and I look forward to hearing future amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rossini. The next person is Dale. Dale, you're unmuted. We'll move on to the next person, Sam. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, well, now I can hear you, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Mr. President and uh, council members, uh, here to talk and, and agree and support uh, Mr. Asimi as well as uh, Mr. Beal on the impacts that we see happening with the, the additional language here. And the, the good intent that's presented is, is not being fulfilled by restricting the general population from driving somewhere and, and acquiring liquor at a different location than other in the other than the community store they may be by or close to the walkable environment, the business enterprises that are impacted as 
as addressed by Mr. Asimi. I think we need to look at that as a whole and not say just as a general blanket impact on the community, this is going to have a significant impact over the current laws that are out there. The effort that was made to clean up the environment around each of these stores changed the signage and allow a better utilization of currently what's on the books instead of adding more restrictions, I think is something that needs to be reconsidered. What currently is there to be able to affect the what is being proposed at this time? The 500 foot or a thousand foot separation is not gonna change a person that's interested in buying alcohol to get in their car and drive further now purchase that alcohol and come back and then return to the residence business or whatever it is. I think some of those restrictions won't have the effect that's intended and that needs to be reconsidered and, and what all this effect actually comes back again to that private business owner. Thank you. That small businessman that wants to move forward in his effort. The next person is Sam. Sam, you have the floor. My name is Sam Bogdanovich. I'm one of the owners of Commercial Retail Associates, a Fresno-based commercial real estate company that's been in business for close to 30 years. My company represents many national tenants throughout the Central Valley and the Central Coast. Our company's clients range from Costco, Save Mart, and 7-Eleven to, to Les Schwab Tires, In-N-Out Burger, Chipotle, and Starbucks. We also lease shopping, center, shopping centers in the same geographic areas. Locally, I have been Ed Cashin's retail consultant for several years and currently work on River Park, Campus Point, and Fancher Creek. I have a very thorough understanding of what's going on in the retail world in our city. I'm here to talk about an unintended consequence of the ordinance if passed as is and suggest that we continue the discussion. As we all know, our world has been turned upside down with COVID-19. The retail landscape hasn't changed or evolved this quickly in the 24 years I've been in commercial real estate like it has in a mere six or seven months since this started. We are seeing companies fail that we never thought would have other, would and others coming out of this <clears throat> stronger than before and, on, and online only. Yet we still don't know who's going to be around when the dust settles. Most of the tenants in our neighborhood shopping centers aren't chains and have spent their life savings staying afloat. My fear is in six months, our neighborhood shopping centers are empty. If we impose such strict guidelines on opening neighborhood markets, some of the smaller strip centers will be left with liquor stores with many spaces sitting empty. Thank you, Sam. I'm Next person is Cody. Cody, you're being unmuted. You have the floor. Hi. I kind of wanted to piggyback off of uh, what Dale was saying. I'm looking at two maps right now. One is the ABC liquor licenses in Fresno. The other is uh, the Fresno Cog VMT map. And I'm showing that when you spread out these liquor licenses, it will raise the VMT. And so I just wanted to bring that up as well, that, that that's also an unintended consequence of this. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Next person is Richard. Richard, please identify yourself. You, you've been unmuted. Richard, going once, going twice. I think you just muted yourself again. Richard, can you hear us? All right, we'll move on to the next person. Uh, Lisa, you are unmuted, you have the floor. Hi, um, I actually like your changes you know, as a member of the public, I don't own a business. I don't own a liquor business or a strip mall or any of that. But as a member of the community, you know, the further west, the further south you go in Fresno, the more liquor stores you see. The further north you go, the less amount of liquor stores you see on every corner. So I look at this as a good thing. And also, too, if you pass it and you change it, great, fabulous. And if it needs to be tweaked and things aren't working out, you know, the business community can always come to the council and ask for it to be tweaked, right? So let's just move forward. Because, you know, I have just seen an inundation of, you know, these liquor stores with cheap wine in poorer communities. 
and what it has done to poor communities. You know, we have, you know, food deserts in West Fresno. When was the last time a CME ever, you know, built a grocery store in West Fresno? You know, somebody you. needs to answer that for me. I'll wait. Thank but you, anyway, Lisa. thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're done with public comment. I do want to go to one person who's been a partner, like the association has, Jose. I'm going to mute you if you want to address the council um, on behalf of the young people. Um, council, we set this up for one o'clock. Um, as you know, most of our high school kids are doing online work, so we're hoping to be able to adjust for their schedules. Um, a lot of them are still occupied doing their online schooling, um, so I wanted to give Jose an opportunity to address the council as he has been and the youth have been at the table with us for the last year on this matter. Jose? Perfect. Can you hear me, Council President? Uh, yes. yes. Thank you so much. It's great to see the mayor, uh, I mean, everyone on the council. I am a uh, staff at the Youth Leadership Institute here in the city of Fresno. Um, I want to thank Council President Arias, Council Member Esparza, and Chavez for really championing this ordinance. Um, so young people, as uh, Council President Arias mentioned earlier, uh, have been working from the Friday Night Live program, which is to be able to reduce alcohol and drug use amongst minors. I've been working on this since 2012, informing the council. Uh, so some of the biggest issues that young people have seen through data that they've collected has been saturation, accessibility, and a lack of accountability for liquor stores. Um, as you heard earlier, uh, California requires, you know, one liquor store for every, no more than every 2,500 residents. Um, south of Shaw, we have one for every 500 residents. Uh, we realize that access of sensitive use areas such as parks and schools and preschools um, has been an issue because that's where our young people uh, play. That's where young people get educated. And so when there's accessibility and there's, it's a Friday night and young people are looking to access alcohol, that walking distance from right outside of their school or right from the park, it makes it a lot easier for them to access it when it is at a walking distance. Whereas a young person who's under 18 or is still in high school um, has to drive out of their way to really access it. And so accessibility through this will be able to remove um, having these uh, parameters in place of being able to have a longer distance from these sensitive use areas will really address that issue of accessibility being too close to young people. Um, the other piece is the advertisements. We realize that in the, the work that young people have been doing that advertisements play a huge role subconsciously of what they see every day, especially if they go to a school that, you know, we have parts in Fresno where there's three liquor stores that are, you know, right across the street from, uh, you know, a high school. And so what they see every day really plays a role subconsciously um, as well. And then um, having this inspection program, we realize that um, one of those things, for example, one of the issues is shoulder tapping where young people will sometimes stand outside of a liquor store and actually ask somebody to get alcohol for them. And so having this inspection program that's being included in here really addresses that too, because it also means that um, liquor stores will be held accountable to make sure that they are selling legally and that, um, that really young people getting into the hands of young people is, can be prevented as much as possible. Um, and as mentioned earlier, I know Serge uh, got to mention this, uh, there's certain parts of Fresno where alcohol is cheaper than water. So we know that accessibility again to young people through price is also more easily accessible to them um, because of the saturation issue. And I just wanna thank lastly um, so much uh, Council President Arias, Esparza and Chavez for championing this and bringing the right partners to the table and I know that it's been over a year of just a ton of conversations. And so just encourage the council to, to really, this, this ordinance will help really address the issue of access to young people. And I apologize our young people weren't able to join the cause as council president Nadia said, they're still in school right now. Uh, but I just wanna thank you for the time. Thank you, Jose. Um, and thank the young people on our behalf. Um, with that council, I'd like to bring it back for questions from the council. If there's none, then this again is just an introduction item. Um, it'll be brought back on October 15th and where we are continuing to commit to all the stakeholders, those who called today, those who have been, we've been working with for a, for a year to continue to refine um, this act to ensure that it meets the intention um, 
of and the best interest of the city. So um, just as a quick note, when we started this process, one of the first meetings I had was with, was with the director of ABC at the state. I actually drove um, to Sacramento prior to COVID and looked at all the data, evaluated all the options, and uh, they were fully supportive of our approach to um, do some additional mitigation and to ensure that there was a market for grocery stores. And um, we are very sensitive to the fact that the market is shifting around full service, you know, 50, 60,000 square foot grocery stores. Um, you should know that we actually want the smaller footprint grocery stores in our neighborhoods. That's what people want. I, I have the luxury of having one next door. I know what it means to have a grocery store next door and reduce the amount of Costco trips that we take as a family up to North Fresno. Um, so uh, we will continue to work on this um, to make sure that we can provide any clarity and reassurance to any of the stakeholders who call today and those who we continue to work with. So unless there's questions from the council, um, I'd like to move on to the next item. All right, uh, Councilman Bredefield, you have the floor. Yeah, I'm just wondering in, in terms of the issues that were raised by uh, some of the folks, how uh, do you plan on making any changes to this ordinance in relation to the, I mean, because some of them seem like very reasonable and uh, yeah. thoughtful concerns. What we've seen, Councilmember Bredefield, is um, we've been getting some, you know, questions and, and some um, input. Um, that's why you saw the two pages of changes that we've made already um, since this, this was approved by the Planning Commission. We're still going through some of that. Um, we've had additional conversations up to this morning. Um, so I, I intend to continue doing the same thing that we've done is make adjustments where it makes sense for neighborhoods, but we're um, also being very clear that what we're trying to do is reduce saturation, not move saturation from the inner city to the outer city, which mm -hmm. um, is something that we gotta be aware of because um, as you know, some of the quote unquote unsaturated zip codes are at the edges of development um, and essentially in my area is Clinton and Blythe and those folks who bought new subdivisions and new homes They don't want to see the saturation replicated in their parts of town So we're trying to be thoughtful of looking for all the unintended consequences um, And I know from Councilmember Chavez and Esparza We're all committed to seeing more grocery stores even if they're smaller footprints inside um, the parts of the, of the food deserts that we have so um, We'll continue to do what we've done is make adjustments refine things make sure that if there's existing language in the code that already does that. And I'll give you an example. Um, when the 4,000 square foot grocery store question was brought to our attention, we had our legal counsel review, not only this act, but all the other existing municipal code. And they're um, uh, comfortable that the, our grocery stores, how we define them in gen general market, healthy food grocer and specialty food grocers, already provide the necessary protections to encourage those kind of grocery stores to come in versus discourage. So um, we're gonna continue communicating and talking with everyone and making sure folks understand um, the intention and the language. And if refinement is required, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, Councilmember Bredefield, to, to piggyback off that answer, um, you know, we're, we're gonna continue to listen to folks and incorporate the components that, that make sense for this and, and but continue the spirit of the legislation um, but we, we got to be cognizant as well that any uh, changes we make cannot be considered substantial uh, changes that trigger us to go back to the drawing board and reinitiate the, the long process that, um, that it's already gone through. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking to the city attorney, right, to answer questions in terms of what is considered substantial versus not substantial and what would re-trigger the process. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you, Councilor Redfield. Council Member Carbossi, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say about this bill, I wanna thank the council president for bringing it forward and all the work and working with so many stakeholders. It's not easy. I think the intent of this bill um, is very pure and it can do a lot of good. And the fact that we're targeting the unintended consequences is gonna make this a much better bill uh, when we actually vote on this matter. So I appreciate your openness and your willingness to improve things in our communities. Thank you, council member. If that is all from the council, I'd like to um, go back to item, the 1020 item and ask for reconsideration. I wasn't here when this item was voted on, so I would need a motion from the winning side to reconsider I would, the item. I would like to make a motion, even though that wasn't granted to me at the uh, consent last week, but I'd like to make a motion for you to consider that. 
thank you, Councillor Betterfield. Um, uh, I owe you one, so it's, it's on the record. Um, is there a second for Councillor Betterfield? Uh, <laughs> this uh, is for um... generosity. Yeah, the animal shelter. Oh, okay. Thank what? you. All right. Let's do, on record? Yes, let's do a roll call for the reconsideration. Uh, City Clerk, the motion is to reconsider the 1020 joint item of the financing powers related to the animal shelter. Council Member Bredefeld? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Aye. Council Member Soria? So is the reconsideration for just discussion or what? Yeah, the council vote, just the council vote, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Council, oh. Yes. Council President Arias, thank yes. you. All right, uh, Council. Thank you for for, for the reconsideration. Um, the record is clear. I owe Councilor Butterfield the, the same courtesy um, next year. Uh, the only question I had, staff, is um, we've been talking about the animal shelter in the terms of a fifteen million dollar project, and what's on the item today is a twenty two million dollar project. So I wanted to give staff an opportunity to explain to the public why there's the difference between. The 50 million we've been discussing thus far, which I believe is related to the building and the total price of 22 million. Also, we got to be able to hear you, Mr. City Controller. Hey, Mayor, how are you? You're muted. All right. Terrible. I heard that, Luis. What? <laughs> hey, Mayor, now you're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay, well, there's the original cost. We had a uh, facility, an existing facility we're going to remodel, I think, by, by 99. With my recollection, Jim can probably correct me, was you know, $15 million plus. And then when uh, Mr. Cashin got involved and was willing to uh, you know, buy a parcel. We looked at different locations, including another one by Golden State Boulevard. But ultimately, the one by the Gap was the best location, which that was, a, I think, a, a cost of about $1 for the land itself. But when you add the cost of the soft cost of in, an engineering cost to it, the project, when you go into bond fees and, and, uh, and commissions, you go into materials, costs rising dramatically. You do what they call capitalized interest. That's basically a construction loan. So those combined, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, or one of the reasons the costs went up. We looked at stuff a year ago with Daryl Reidenauer on this $40, $50 million in costs. So this came in originally in the, fit, and the thing was presented by Tim Simons originally in I think the 15 to 16, $17 million price range. And then we had our people, Scott Moser and Jim and others go through and do make some corrections to make the engineering proper. But those are the factors primarily that uh, escalated the cost. But I believe that that cost of 22 million for what we're getting is a good bargain. And Jim, you can also, we added some uh, features on, for example, there was no uh, clinic for spade and neuters that was the, on, on the original design. So those are some of the other things that added to the cost. And Jim or uh, Mike, let me fill them in where I left out. That's good. pretty bad. Um, I, I think this is karma, Mike, for, for, for all the times you give us a hard time about spending CARES Act dollars. Hmm. So a, anybody in the city manager's office have an audio that works or, or um... <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I'll be <laughs> See if we can get this thing here. Mm. Give you guys two seconds. Mike, you're welcome to come into my office and you know use my audio. Or uh, any of you guys can come over and explain it to us. 
I, I wouldn't I um, hassle you, except it's a lot of money. So, you know, we want to be clear about the $7 million difference. You can wear a mask. This is a move to increase IT's budget. I think this is all it's all about. <laughs> no, this, this is a move to decrease your budget. Oh. If somebody wants to come to the library, it works in here. Did you guys hear me okay? Yes, we hear you perfectly, Mayor. City Council Chamber works pretty good too. <laughs> what about Councilmember Chavez? Uh, does your internet bill, did you pay that bill? Does it work? It's working. It's working. Got a hot spot. <laughs> hey, what, what, what if we just have him call in on the phone and leave the camera on and we can hear the audio but see him talking? Uh, creative solution. Yeah. Uh, leave it up to the millennial to find a worker on to IT. <laughs> They're, they're, they're moving to the library. Uh, just give them two seconds and they'll be up and running. M Mayor, um, do you, while we're waiting, do you have a, a schedule for construction? Do we know when, when that is? We've been working, you know, you guys approved the amendment last week um, with the querying construction. We'll join Tim Simons and Paul Querying has got a great reputation. He's got, a, he's got the bonding capacity. He's built major multi-million dollar projects. So. I think it adds more to the to the project in terms of credibility and, and timeline. But we're looking at right now a uh, completion time sometime late in 2021. That's what it looks like right now. Okay. And our, our commitment with SPCI, they gave us two six months. Can, can, can you guys hear me now? Thank you. So we're, we are in uh, Council Member Kabasi's office and we'll try and answer some questions. Um, first of all, the uh, I'm, I'm going to let Mike explain the 22 million bonding amount, uh, and and that has to do with the minimum amount of bonding we can secure cost effectively. Uh, I believe uh, since day one we've said the minimum amount is 20 million dollars. Um, as far as the uh, 14 to 16 million dollars roughly construction cost, that's the predicted cost we had all along. And I, I feel we're still within that window. Um, but there are some other costs that are associated with the project. Uh, vehicles, we're estimating roughly $500,000. Uh, medical equipment uh, is an additional probably $500,000. We have contingency in there as we typically would 10%. Um, and then the soft costs that the uh, mayor had mentioned. So, and I, I I don't have the latest estimate from me, but I believe it was around $18.5 million, everything in. Um, now, because the loan amount or the bond amount minimum is $20 million, we have some options to do with that. If we don't uh, utilize all of that bond amount, we can apply that towards uh, payment paying back the bond, which was one thing we looked at as a potential. That way, uh, it, you know, if, if we move forward with that uh, amount, which is the minimum, uh, in in sense, we could make payments uh, if we haven't spent all that money in the startup cost. I'm going to let Mike talk about the 20 versus 22 million. Uh, so we're going to swap spots here. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so um, in addition to all the costs associated with the project, the construction, the equipment, uh, the contingency costs, there's also costs of issuance, which are uh, costs that are uh, that we pay to our to the bank for selling the bonds, uh, that we pay to uh, the lawyers. We have a bond council. We have a disclosure council. So all these folks also get paid. And so that adds to the cost of the issuance as well. Uh, and that's in the tune of about a half million dollars, uh, uh, much along the lines of, of some of the equipment costs. And then uh, we also have, as Jim kind of alluded to, we have a year of capitalized interest in there. And that basically covers the debt payment while the building is being constructed. 
And that's a full year of debt service in there. So that's, a, as I mentioned earlier today, that's about uh, a million eight right there. So that's how you get to the 22, between all the construction costs and all the other items. Uh, when you, the construction contract at its core is about 15 million. I believe council approved that in May. Then with all the other equipment costs and all the other contingencies, that get you up to about 18, 19. And then we have another two to 2.5 million of uh, issuance costs plus capitalized interests that are included in that. So at the end of the day, we're at about 21. We rounded up to 22 just to give us cushion in case something comes up in the next couple of weeks that before the bond sale where we go, oh my gosh, we should have added this in. We have that. I can assure council we will only bond for what that project is projected to cost. So we may not use the full 22 million of authority. We will just use what is necessary in order to complete the project. But it gives us a cushion in case something pops up in the next couple of weeks or so before the bond sale that we can make that adjustment without having to come back to councils and get Understood. further, um, so, further so authorization. Just one clarifying point for me specifically. Um, we're about to enter the, the, the journey of uh, budgeting in October. Um, and you know it's all about the general fund. Is, is it fair to say that since you're bonding for all this, not just the construction, but the equipment and all these elements in this package that you won't need any general fund money this upcoming year for the animal shelter? That is correct, yes. The capitalized interest that's buried in there will pay the debt service. The first debt service payment on these bonds from the general fund isn't anticipated until FY22. Okay. Any other questions from the council? Motion to approve. All right. So moved. Second. Is, is that a motion to reapprove? Yes. To approve. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, um, roll call, please. Let me go to the public. Anybody in the public have any questions on this item? Let me see here. Uh, the dogs and cats of Fresno, thank you. <laughs> Believe it or not, roll call? Yeah, I, after uh, uh, potholes, dogs and cats are the second issue for a lot of our residents. So uh, right. we, we have a lot of cat and, and, and dog lovers and um, we're doing a pretty big deal and making sure they have the right facility. All right, roll call, please. Council Member Bredefield? Yes. Council Member Chavez? Yes. Council Member Esparza? Aye. Council Member Carbasi? Aye. Council Member Soria? Yes. Council President Arias? Yes. Thank you, Council. Um, Council, before we, we proceed with, with a closed session, I wanted to make a, a quick um, report to the public over our budget hearings uh, for this year and when they're gonna commence. Um, so as agreed upon by the administration, the staff is gonna provide and publish uh, the general fund budget by October 2nd. We will begin um, budget hearings on Monday, October 12th, at which point we'll hear the general fund overview, airports, facts, the convention center. Hopefully we'll go to lunch and we'll come back and hear public works and public utilities. On Tuesday, October 13th, we'll hear the information services, personnel services, finance, lunch break, uh, police and fire. On October 14th, we'll hear parks, uh, planning and development, the city clerk, the city attorney, the mayor, city manager, and, and city council budgets. And we're gonna leave um, Thursday, October 15th in the afternoon for some carryover items that we don't get to and departments. And then we'll make motions on October 20th. Um, at that time, of course, we can hear motions during any of the budget hearings. And then we're gonna try and complete the budget for a final vote on Thursday, October 22nd. And the city clerk will publish the following calendar and make it available on our city website so everybody knows. Um, Council, you should have received an email from our city attorney outlining the procedures for this upcoming budget hearing. As a reminder, um, it is considered officially an amendment to the budget. So votes would have to be five votes um, to move items forward instead of our traditional four votes. Um, and with that, Council, we will conclude the public portion of this meeting and we turn to closed session to complete our last item. Um, Mayor, uh, we'll see you in closed session as well. And for the public, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you at the next budget hearings um, 
is the next time that we'll talk if we don't have an emergency meeting or special meeting before then. Thank you all. Don't forget we're adjourning in the memory of RBG. Several folks, yeah. Yes, so we're adjourning in the memory of all the individuals that we outlined today and uh, we will get through 2020 together and um, you know push through. Thank you all. That separate link for the closed session? Um, your same closed session one that you had in your calendar earlier today.